Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Alfred Marx and Kenneth Williams in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome once again to Just a Minute. And uh, once again, it's a great pleasure to welcome back young Alfred Marx, who's uh, come back to do battle with our three regulars, Peter Jones, Kenneth Williams and Clement Freud. And they will all try and speak, if they can, <laughs> at some time, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject that I will give them, if they can. And we've started the show off in great form because here, Mr. Beside me is stripping. What it means, I don't know, but let us begin the show with Kenneth Williams this week, and it's Kenneth... Oh, what a good subject to start the show. How I get going. <laughs> this audience has obviously been here before, and they've seen you get going sometimes, Kenneth, but would you talk on the subject for just a minute, starting now? I put on my coat, and I get out of the pressure and start swinging my arms backward and forward, and do feel that the air is really doing me some good. And I think that when you get into a rhythm and the blood is circulating properly, the adrenaline flowing through the old veins, one really understand that you are one, so to speak, with the whole pantheistic world of nature, beauteous and bountiful in the extreme. And then open the old gob and receive the nutriments which flow down the alimentary canal. And then say to yourself, what a blowout I've had. Oh, I feel quite replete and wash it down with the odd glass of mead. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged you. Uh, repetition of down. <laughs> yes. The nutriments went down and now you were washing it down. So you did repeat that and uh, Peter got in with nine seconds left. He gets a point for a correct challenge and the subject is how I get going, Peter, starting now. Well, first of all, I go to bed at night fairly early, setting the alarm clock for pretty late. And then, when it rings, I leap out of bed, refreshed by a long period of sleep. Well, at the end of that round, Peter Jones got a point for his challenge, and also for one for speaking when the whistle went, which tells us that 60 seconds is up, as you probably know, so he's the only one to have scored in the first round. Alfred Marks, will you begin the second round? The subject is my first bike. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Like a man's first love, you never forget your first bike. I come from the east end of London and was very poor. In fact, I was made in Japan. And so, <laughs> we couldn't afford to buy bikes. We had to go and hire one. And the shop round the corner was a bit of a fagin because the bike either had a bell or brakes. You couldn't have both. And invariably the chain fell off just at the crucial moment. For example, when you're just about to slide under a bus for insurance purposes, the chain would then connect itself and then I... Uh, Kenneth Williams has changed chain, life. Two yeah. chain, one each side of the wheel. You, see. <laughs> you rather change yourself up there, Alfred. And uh, Kenneth got in with the correct challenge, and there are 29 seconds for my first bike, Kenneth, starting now. It was a standard rally, and I used to go all over the rolling countryside, around a little market town called Bister in Oxfordshire, and die by Lake Abingdon, and read my poetry. And on the saddle of my bike, or attached to the aforementioned article, I had a little bag into which I would stuff sandwiches and first flasks and tomatoes, and things from my allotment which I grew also delightful strawberries with little bits of straw to keep them from the birds and the frost, you know. And often... <laughs> Do you believe he had all that stuff in the back of his bicycle when he was... <laughs> But it was lovely. We all wanted... the tomatoes, aren't it? No, the strawberries and the straw... Strawberries and tomatoes. What a sandwich. And all the birds <laughs> fluttering round him trying to peck at his strawberries. <laughs> anyway, it was a lovely picture that you... Yes, anyone could take the rise. Anyone could, take the... anyone could sit there doing that. Well, I'd like to see you have a go. I'd just like to see you get keep going for 60 seconds. And I'd like to see... I'd like to see your reaction. I'd like to see. <laughs> sit there, take the rise. Calling to help him. Kenny. Kenny. <laughs> Control yourself, Kenneth. You are overacting. Yes, I know. He's now falling off his chair. 
Kenneth, you did almost take them. You almost took them in for a moment. Don't do it. Uh, you've got two points in that round. You're equal with Peter Jones and Clement Freud. We're nice to hear from you in your turn to begin. The subject, communication. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Peter Jones is a challenge. Is it Cajun? Hesitation. Also a deviation because he hasn't heard from me. <laughs> the subject is communication, and oh. whether you heard or not, you're still supposed to try and speak on the subject. I see. And uh, Peter had I a correct failed. challenge. <laughs> yes, they couldn't believe it, actually. Mm. They let you go in for three seconds in silence. Peter, there are 57 and a half seconds for communication, starting now. Silence can be very eloquent, just as a silence can... Uh, Clement Freud has challenge. Repetition of silence. Yes, I'm afraid he did say silence before. Yes. In the same sense, it is a poetic statement, like your birds coming down eating your strawberries was a rather poetic image. Quite. And yes. it can be pregnant, but it doesn't take nine months. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Peter. Well said. Uh, Clement Freud, you had the correct challenge then, and 52 seconds for communication starting now. Communication is the art of conveying a thought, a reason, purpose, or whatever to another person or persons by speech or radio waves or possibly television. I am a communicator, meaning that I practice the art of communications in whatever medium I choose. At one time, I worked for a newspaper, a magazine, journal, publications of all sorts, and then graduated to the waves of the air as purchased and broadcast by the British Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. The British Broadcasting Corporation has never purchased the waves of the air. Yes. Mm. Couldn't have done. Yes, yes. They do, actually, mm. yes. <laughs> they have to pay for the use of the waves. Ah, yes, but they don't pay. No, they rent them. No, they don't, they don't purchase the waves. You're quite right. It. I they think that's they, a good... They issue. purchase the right to, to use, use them. them. I think that's a very good and, and a clever mm. challenge. Very yes. good, yes. Yes. <laughs> There are 12 seconds for Awfully communication, good. Peter, with Very you, good. starting good now. I don't Very think, on the whole, it's, it's improving. It's and challenge. I'm not going to be Quite put right. off by I'm this man yeah. speaking when I'm talking. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Deviation. Nothing about communication so far. <laughs> yes, I was demonstrating it. Yes, you definitely were, Peter. And under great difficulty, because Clement Freud was trying to nobble you as they say, metaphorically much. speaking, because the other right. side of the uh, uh, stage here. Uh, there are four and a half seconds left for communication, Peter, with you starting now. We don't want the House of Commons manners brought into this respectable yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, what, 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 sorry. Score. The score, yes. I had a message then, and so the score. Peter Jones, you have increased your lead considerably at the end of that round. You've got a number of points, including one for speaking as the whistle went. And it is your turn to begin. The subject's knick-knacks. Will you tell us something about knick-knacks in just a minute, starting now? Well, it's one of my hobbies, collecting knick-knacks, and I've got a number of them. Quite a few knockers and some uh, <laughs> driftwood. And I've got some ginger beer bottles. Uh, Clement, Kenneth Williams has challenged. I've got twice. Did he say I've got yes. twice? Mm. Oh, well, well done. Um, you have a... <laughs> <laughs> you have the subject uh, of knick-knacks, uh, Kenneth, and there uh, are 47 seconds left, starting now. All kinds of my drawers. I've got some lovely little cufflink knick-knacks, and I've got some very nice little... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Repetition of I've got. <laughs> yes. You did say, I've got twice, so he's got you back. Mm, I don't believe it. <laughs> now, say, I've got twice, Clement, I trust you. Yes, you did. I mean, the thing is that if we take each other up on such small words as that, which are often we allow to pass, uh, it's going to get a bit difficult. But there are Well, I take it back, I take it back. No, 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 he had you with it, so you well, got him with it. The only that, reason, yes, I right. thought, since 40... he displayed such appalling taste in interrupting me, I thought it might teach him a lesson. If I did the same to him. When, when, since when did taste come into play in just a minute? Uh, when I joined the game. Uh, 
Well said, Peter. 42 seconds for knickknacks starting now. They can be terribly cheap. You can pick them up lying around in roadways and in parks and fields even. A, a cork that's been discarded on a rubbish heap can have Chateau Latour written on it. And although you may not be able to afford a bottle of the wine itself, this souvenir of somebody else's imbibing is a rather nice thing to have, to look at. It may still have a small scent or perfume still there. Uh, and Alfred Marks a challenge. Oh, hesitation, I thought. Yes, hesitation, yes. 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 He was. Mm, yes. <laughs> I thought you were going to say repeat it still, but um, uh, there are 13 seconds, Alfred, for knickknacks starting now. Knick-knack, paddy-whack, give the dog a bone was a song featured in the Inn of the Sixth Happiness which starred Ingrid Bergman. This has nothing at all to do with knick-knacks as we understand them. Knick-knacks refer to bric a -brac. Uh, Peter Jones, a child. A deviation. Why? Because it had nothing whatever to do with knick-knacks. <laughs> <laughs> he said... It had got nothing whatever to do with knick-knacks as we know them, so he was not actually deviating from the subject But he's asked to talk about knick-knacks as we Don't know them, isn't he? You said yourself it was an admission. Do not argue with sir, please. Who is sir? He is sir. Oh, well. <laughs> no, right. he wasn't actually deviating from the subject. Parsons. He made a, a knick-knack Parsons. <laughs> Nicolax uh, Parsons. There is one second left, uh, Alfred, for you on knick-knacks starting now. Nick-knack. <laughs> so, uh, the situation is that Alfred Marks has gained points in that round, including the one for speaking as a whistle went. He's now equal uh, in second place with Kenneth Williams. Peter Jones is in a commanding lead, and you might be surprised to hear that Clement Freud is in fourth place with one point. <laughs> I'm not surprised, personally, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Ken Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Pompeii. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? One of the old and great cities. It was a Samnite city before the conquest by the Romans in around, what, 1 B.C. And then fell that tragic event in A.D. 79 when, with the eruption of that volcano Vesuvius, this delightful place was simply covered in volcanic ash, which had the extraordinary effect of preserving masses of it intact and afterwards gave archaeologists a veritable field day. They found among the relics there 81 loaves, each weighing two pounds, buried in a baker's oven. Would you believe? Well, you'll have to because it is a fact. And all over the shop were various advertisements saying, come in here, three couches of bacon. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, knowing his history and loving Roman history particularly, took the subject of Pompeii, told us a great deal about it, was not interrupted, so he gets a point for speaking as the whistle went and a bonus point for no interruptions. And he's still in third place. <laughs> I'm wrong. He's now in second place, ahead of Alfred Marx, but still behind our leader, Peter Jones. Um, Alfred, your turn to begin. The subject is behaviour. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Convention expects, nay demands, certain codes of behaviour. Don't we remember our elders telling us whenever we visited relatives or friends, be on your best behaviour. Even if you are starving, do not ask for seconds. Always excuse yourself if you want to leave the room. Don't laugh at Uncle Harry eating his soup, and don't stare in amazement at Auntie Hilda's bust. You see, all these things come under the general heading of behaviour. We have a certain mean, a certain demeanour, which is expected of us. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Two seconds. Repetition. Two, uh, yes, yes. Two what? You were too certain then. Certainly too certain, certain. Yes. yes. Well, that's what comes of being too certain. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Certain behaviour, certain demeanour. Right, 31 seconds, Clement. Behaviour starting now. The nicest child I ever knew was Charles Augustus Fortescue. He never tore his socks or stretched his pinafore. When eating bread, he made no crumbs. He was extremely fond of sums, to which, however, he preferred the parsing 
of a Latin word. When asked when it was in his power, he gave information twice an hour. And as for thinking mutton fat unappetizing, far from that, he often at his father's board would beg them of his own accord to give him if they didn't mind. Well, May I think... say the deviations from the text were entirely that I wouldn't have to repeat words. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was it was it was it was a brilliant uh, achievement, Clement, and no. that, that recall from your childhood, which was years ago, as we all know, no. to <laughs> recite that uh, was was marvellous. Congratulations! I can't give you a bonus point, but I can give you one for speaking as the whistle went, and you're now equal with Alfred Marx in third place. And Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is hemlock. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Hemlock is addictive and sore to Socrates, or to put it another way, the great sage ate it and kicked the bucket. <laughs> I'm always in the habit of confusing it with ambrosia, which is equally hard to get hold of, although tinned in the form of rice pudding, I believe, and available at some supermarkets where it is marked 2p off without any indication uh, of what was it challenged. was before. I think deviation. Kenneth, are you with us? Because you've got a correct challenge on the subject in 34 seconds to talk on hemlock starting now. This derives, of course, from the plant known as henbane and was administered notably by Clytemnestra, who said to Agamemnon, do you fancy a drop of something? When he was in his bath and he, thinking she was going to offer him a light ale, had fun. Kenneth, what is challenge? Hesitation. Yes, there was a hesitation, because you stopped speaking, and therefore, even if you were mouthing words, it, um, it was a hesitation. There are 19 seconds left, Clement, for hemlock, starting now. A hemlock could also be a sort of feminine sartorial chastity girdle by using a <laughs> chain and a padlock to tie your boot to the bottom of your hem, therefore uh, securing the A hemlock is no such thing, and it's a devious, a devious in the extreme to pretend that it is. You can lock Mike, your hems. Mike, no, I don't do believe You don't lock Mike, your hems. A lot, a lot of good it would do you anyway. They'd just tear off something else, wouldn't they? <laughs> As I know to my cost, I've been taking advantage of. Yes. Dennis, I've been taking advantage of. Mm, well, you loved it, actually. <laughs> Never in just a minute. Did you enjoy no. it? Oh, well, no, 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 go on, go on. <laughs> Nine seconds for hemlock starting now. Well, as I was saying, you see, they take this root of henbane and extract... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Repetition of henbane. You said henbane before when you were talking. Oh, what a shame. Mm. I was so anxious to inform Four people seconds, about... Clement, with hemlock starting now. Hemlock today would be a white powder probably produced by a pharmaceutical... <laughs> Well, Clement Freud was in the fourth place a little while ago, but it doesn't take him long to catch up. And in that round, he got a lot of points, including one for speaking as a whistle went. He's now um, in third place, but only two behind... No! He's only one behind Peter Jones, who is one behind Kenneth Williams, who has now become our leader. <laughs> and as our listeners have heard, he's brought his usual supporters club with him. Um... <laughs> Uh, the uh, subject is rackets. Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin, and there are 60 seconds starting now. I do believe there are more rackets today than there ever were. And one of the worst is this practice by supermarkets of putting 2p off certain things, <laughs> and also saying bumper offer and giving people a plastic flower or something if they spend over a hundred pounds. It's all <laughs> absolutely ludicrous and terribly misleading. I think it's high time that the consumers all got together and rebelled and ostracized and stayed away from the supermarkets who... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Uh, repetition of supermarket. Yes, oh, yes, you had the supermarket did, yes. before. Yes, rackets, uh, Clement, with you, and 31 seconds left, starting now. One of the lesser-known things about the sport of tennis is that a racket need not actually be of any specific size. And this was high-lit or pinpointed only quite recently when it was found that a racket nearly one and a half times as large as the usual one was used in a competition whereby a player of Yugoslavian origin, although he played under the auspices or flag of Romania, won a competition in Forest Hills by employing this means. <laughs> Now, 
which interesting information kept uh, uh, Clement Roy going until the whistle went and gained that extra point, and he's now equal in the lead with Kenneth Williams, but they're only one ahead of uh, Peter Jones. Kenneth, the subject is um, speech habits. It's your turn to begin, and there are 60 seconds starting now. These vary from age to age. A few... Uh, Clement Freud. Age to age. Alas. Um, Alas. 52 seconds are left for speech habits, Clement, starting now. Uh, Kenneth Williams' is challenge. I haven't done anything. He pressed my button. <laughs> Hesitation. Uh, hesitation. Well done. Yes, Kenneth, that's perfectly correct. <laughs> I will just tell you that um, Clement Freud sits beside Kenneth Williams, and he can be very sporting on occasions, and tell you that Kenneth has 55 seconds to talk on speech habits starting now. Well, of course, do you see, if you are a person who comes from the upper classes, you will inevitably develop quite different speech habits to those who come from the lower elements in society. A man like Disraeli... Uh, Alfred Marx, the oh, I think. I'm afraid, yes. so he couldn't think of a good example in time. Alfred, you have the subject for after a correct challenge, and there are 38 seconds for speech habits starting now. One of the most fascinating men I ever met had the most extraordinary of speech habits. He used to hesitate, deviate, and repeat himself. An example of a typical speech might be... Uh, uh, Clement Freud. Uh, deviation. Why? Deviation isn't a speech habit. It's a habit of logic. It's not a speech habit. Yes. That's the habit he was talking right. about, not the deviation. Yes. And so that uh, challenge was well Very tried, right. but incorrect. And uh, no, no, it's perfectly correct. You can understand it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, you are absolutely wicked. You get that audience going, and no matter what you say, they applaud you. And you try to make me look out a ninny and a nana. Don't you allow me. It's not difficult, man. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, you, I think you're all rotten. I will stick to my uh, guns and say that uh, what oh, I said before was accurate me. and Alfred Marx was correct and he has 28 seconds to continue with speech habits starting now. It was so exasperating to try to hold a conversation when all he said was, um, uh, um, um. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Repetition of um. <laughs> I would that agree. Of, um, yes. Uh, there are 22 seconds for speech habits, Clement, yes. starting now. One of the most common speech habits is stammering or stuttering, which... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Stammering and stuttering is, are not speech habits. They are speech defects, which is quite a different matter. Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and very, very sweet of you to applaud me in that fashion. You are only acknowledging merit in me. <laughs> <laughs> They, it's, it's 17 seconds speech habits starting now. Well, now, uh, one of the most interesting speech habits is the inability of Germans to pronounce certain letters. Instead of the W, they often do it as V. They say words, a word. I think I hear a word, you see, and the TH goes into S, like this, or it's just talking like this, you see. And if I'm in there... Uh, Clement Freud challenged you just Repetition before. of this. Yes, there was too many... Well, systems. I was just down to embroider Clement. Mm. I mean... You know, and that's a speech well, habit, isn't it? Uh, I would have defended yourself on a speech habit, but you weren't quick enough there, Kenneth. Uh, there is one-fifth of a second left <laughs> for a speech habit with you, Clement, starting now. <laughs> Well, uh, Clement Freud has increased his lead at the end of that round, but Kenneth Williams is keeping up the challenge. He's only two points behind, and Peter Jones has remained reasonably static, um, but he's still in the game, and so is Alfred Marx, who's going to begin the next round. Alfred, the subject is more. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Probably the most famous cry of more came from Oliver Twist in Charles Dickens' immortal novel of the same name, I want more, and he got it. Also, of course, other things. Uh, let us broaden the spectrum. Look at the state of the world today. Everyone demands more. The workers demand more money. The capitalists demand more capital. And Peter Jones' challenge. Demands Repetition. the point. Yes. yes. There was, there's Repetition. a bit too right. much demanding, wasn't there? Right. That's what I said, you see. I know there demanding. is. 
Would the audience please keep quiet? They're having a sing song. <laughs> <laughs> Who's talking in the audience? Listen to just a minute or go home, please. <laughs> there are 39 seconds, Peter, for Moore starting now. There's Old Moore and Kenneth Moore and Patrick Moore. That's a name that springs to mind because you may recall that he was a guest on this very program and did extremely well because he was able to speak at enormous speed. I don't remember what he said. I can't remember... <laughs> Uh, uh, yes. Clement Freud has challenged. Uh, to remember. Yes. yes. And uh, there are 21 seconds left for more with you, Clement, starting now. As it is a rule of this game that you may repeat the word on the card, I would like to remind the audience of a song called Don't Have Any More, Mrs. Moore. If you have any more, Mrs. Moore, you will have to marry the man next door. So <laughs> don't have any more, Mrs. Uh, Moore. Kenneth Williams has challenged. Deviation. Why? Because the lyric is not you'll have to marry the man next door, you'll have to rent the house next door. Well that done. Well, yes. You'll yes. not marry the man. No, well done. Alfred, that what did you want later. to say? Oh, there was also a couple of hands there, wasn't there? It was too uh, late was now, too late. Alfred. No, I'm, I'm just sorry. saying, I'll just throw it in, in case he's yes. just to back up Kenneth. Oh. <laughs> you I want to see Mr. Freud demolished too soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we only have about uh, a minute left before the end of the show, a and minute. he's got a quite a strong lead, and there are only five seconds left for Kenneth to talk, so it's going to be rather difficult. But do your best, Kenneth. Uh, the subject is more starting now. That is what people are demanding of me. More Kenneth Williams. We want more of him. They scream it at me from the house. <laughs> Well, we certainly couldn't have too much of Kenneth Williams in just a minute, and the same goes for Peter Jones and Alfred Marx and Clement Freud, and let me tell you how they all finished up in this edition of Just a Minute. Well, Alfred Marx, returning again, did extremely well, but he did finish in fourth place this time. He was a little way behind Peter Jones, who at one time had the lead, who was just behind Kenneth Williams, who was always in this game challenging this week's winner, Clement Freud. I hope that you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute and will want to be with us again next week when once again four panellists and myself take to the air and try and play this delightful game. Until then, from all of us here tonight, goodbye. <laughs> The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Brow. Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo and Kenneth Williams in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and uh, welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard from our announcer, we have our four regular male panellists competing against each other. And as usual, they will try and speak for just a minute on the subject that I will give them without hesitation, repetition or deviating from that subject. And we're going to begin the show this week with Derek Nimmo and the subject is the broads. Derek, will you tell us something about the broads in just a minute, starting now? The broads, I suppose, really, one of the most delightful parts of England. Uh, Norfolk, I think, is almost my favourite county. They were to a large extent, or man-made, because it was when they started to draw an excessive amount of peat from the land that these indentations were formed, which then became ponds and lakes and little rivers and tributaries flowed into them. These days, 
they are used, I suppose, mainly for pleasure purposes, although there is a wealth of wildlife living on the banks of the broads. And boating there during the summer months is particularly delectable. One passes in that county such beautiful <gasps> churches. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. A repetition of county. Yes, yes. I mean, we can't mention Norfolk enough because it is a wonderful county. They make some wonderful television programs up there. <laughs> and, um, but you did repeat the word county, so it was a correct challenge on the half of Peter Jones, and so there's a point there, Peter, and there are 25 seconds left for the broads starting now. I think that the broads were the people that the GIs were most anxious to meet when they came over at the beginning of World War II. Uh, Derek Nimmer has challenged. Deviation. Alas, they didn't come over at the beginning of no, World War II. No, it would be quite II. different if they had, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, so well, it was nearer the beginning than the end. <laughs> didn't seem so at the time. At the beginning. <laughs> So it was deviation, and there are 13 seconds, Derek, for you. You have a point for a correct challenge, and you get the subject of the broads back starting now. I've forgotten those sort of mall-like ladies that are called broads. Yes, are they derived perhaps from the word broadway? Maybe, I don't know. But when one is in New York, one seems to see a tremendous number of broads, and very lovely they are too, and as they trot around in their... Well, Ian Messiter brings his little whistle with him to every programme and he blows it, blows it. <laughs> he blows it at the end of 60 seconds that tells us that the time is up and whoever is speaking at that moment gains the extra point. Derek Nimmo, you did so then and you are now in the lead at the end of the first round. Clement Freud, will you begin the next round and the subject so apt for our game, Letting Off Steam. Would you talk on that in just a minute, starting now? Letting off steam virtually means that if you are pent up, or full of things, or replete with go, as Kenneth Williams would have it. You rest for a moment or two in order... Uh, Derek Nimmo, challenge. Three oars. <laughs> well, um, that was a correct challenge, Derek. I don't hesitate in giving it to you. And there are 47 seconds letting off steam, starting now. Letting off steam, I suppose, was one of the first expressions to come into the language from the steam age. Hitherto, we'd used mainly things from the world of sail. To let off steam means to take the lid off. I mean, if you had a great big engine and there was an excess of steam, you in some way release the steam to rem rem remove the and pressure. Uh, <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, hesitation. Yes, he couldn't get his steam out, could he? Then? <laughs> his lid was stuck on, and so uh, Peter Jones got in with a correct challenge and 29 seconds left, letting off steam, Peter, starting now. It takes me back to the days of the old steam trains on the Great Western Railway that carried people. Uh, Derek Nimmo. Hesitation. Yes, I think I agree with that, Derek. And there are 20 seconds left for letting off steam starting now. The London, Midland and Scottish Railway. I lived quite near to a railway embankment and I remember when I was a time... I, I know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Repetition of railways. Yes, there was two <laughs> railways there. And uh, perhaps what happened? I, I got as far as rail, and I said the relation a bit rather quickly, hoping you wouldn't hear, but I knew you. <laughs> well, he's got good hearing, and he has uh, 14 seconds for letting off steam starting now. One of the most attractive parts of letting off steam is that if you live close to a railway, you wake up in the middle of the night, especially if the train does not come past, saying, Good heavens, what was that? And it is. <laughs> <laughs> I must explain to the listeners that uh, Ian Messiter enjoyed Clement Freud's remarks so much that I nearly swallowed his whistle. <laughs> That's why the noise came from the back of his epiglottis. Peter, will you begin the next round? The subject is bumbling. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, it would be easier, really, to give you a demonstration of it than talk about it. However, that's one of the rules of the game, is it, that one has to make an attempt to discuss or describe or analyse the reasons for attempting to make... Uh... <laughs> Kenneth Williams' challenge. My hesitation, I thought. Yes, he really wanted to describe it. He was finding great... I mean, sorry, demonstrate it. Great definitely on the description. So Kenneth got in. Nice to hear from you, Kenneth. Yes, and I was um, worried, really. Uh, there are four, I'm sure the audience are waiting to hear from you, too. And there are 44 seconds on bumbling. 
starting now. This is the method of speech whereby you don't actually stop speaking as certain other people do when they are accused of mumbling, that is to say, not so much cease as become indistinct or inarticulate, lacking in fluency, one might put it like that. On the other hand, this means to fill in with a mass of verbiage, things which really are little to the point, irrelevant, and people could rightly say... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. A repetition of people. Yes, I'm afraid you mentioned the people before, and so um, Peter Jones has got a correct challenge, and the subject is bumbling, and there are nine seconds left starting now. Yes, well, I'd like to make a collection of the bumbles that I've heard down the years that have caused me to get dreadful school reports. <laughs> well, um, Peter Jones got points in that round, and he's now equal in the lead with Derek Nimmo. Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin, and the subject, ah, lovely one, sawing a woman in half. <laughs> Will you tell us something about it in just a minute, starting now? This is a disgraceful subject to put down in a video program like this. On the other hand, of course, if we were interpreting it as a conjurer's trick, then it is permissible to discuss it. Obviously, nobody in their right mind would saw a lady in half, apart from Dr. Buck Ruxton. I don't know anyone that's actually attempted it. But the magicians do it by means... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Reputation of magician. Yes, yeah. you mentioned the magician before. I'm oh, sorry. did Kendra. I? Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I think you said magic, actually, didn't you? No, conjuring, is it? Conjuring. Conjuring. I I yes, did. I know. I was this thing. I said conjuring trick. <laughs> <laughs> So, I I did so you, uh, it was a wrong challenge. Mm. And there are 42 seconds. We're still with you, Kenneth, having got a point for that wrong challenge. Sawing a woman in half starting now. Sawing a woman in half is illusory. She gets into this contraction, do you see? And bits of her are hanging out at each end. <laughs> so that you think when the blade appears to be actually penetrating the timber that it is actually going in. Oh, Derek Nemo challenge. Repetition of act. Two actuallys, yes. Twenty seconds are left for sawing a woman in half. Can you do it in that time, Derek, starting now? Standing in the Alhambra Theatre on the stage was the great Houdini. On was pushed a great trolley and a beautiful girl with golden hair down her back standing five foot three and a quarter inches in her caminickers, climbed into the box, and he lifted up the blade, and with one great sweep, swished it through, and... Well, uh, Derek Nemo was speaking as the whistle went, gained another point, and he's increased his lead at the end of that round. Uh, I would have challenged him, actually, because I thought Houdini was an escapologist and wasn't a magician. I don't think he ever did that trick. Mm. But, uh, Probably not, I don't I'm not playing the game, so I don't know. <laughs> Superstitions is the next subject, and Derek, it is your turn to begin, so would you start and tell us something about that in just a minute? Now, walking along the street, I saw a ladder right across, and I thought, well, I mustn't walk underneath it, because if I do, something absolutely Frightful will happen to me. So I stepped to avoid it, and I was knocked down by a man on a tricycle. Now, I thought this teaches you a lesson. One should not be superstitious. And in fact, I tend not to be in on the whole, but sometimes if I knock over some salt, I will throw it over my um, shoulder. And Clement Freud has challenged. Repetition of knocked over. It, well, knock, anyway. Yes, that's correct, Clement. There are 35 seconds with you now to talk about superstitions starting now. One of the most realistic superstitions is, if you're a woman, never to be sawn in half, <laughs> neither by Houdini nor by anyone else. But in fact, it is a misnomer. Uh, Derek Nimmer has said yes, that's not a superstition. I would agree that's not a superstition not to be sawn in half. <laughs> no, it's a warning. <laughs> it's terribly unlucky to be sawn in half. <laughs> Very unlucky, but it's not superstition. Uh, and, uh, Derek, uh, you have the subject back. There are 23 seconds left, starting now. If you touch wood, it is supposed to be very lucky. This is said to derive from the habit of touching a piece of the original cross, but in fact, historians have shown that it goes back very uh, much Clement earlier Freud, in time. Repetition of in fact, he said it twice in his previous 
preamble. <laughs> All right, Clements, there are 13 seconds for you to take over the subject of superstitions starting now. Keeping a balloon in your left-hand jacket pocket is one of the lesser-known superstitions, <laughs> yet one which I believe is gaining in popularity. <laughs> Peter Jones is challenging. Well, I'm chancing my arm on your advice. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's lesser known. I don't think it's known at all. <laughs> I'll tell you something else. It's certainly not gaining a popularity. <laughs> no, that's for sure. I've had balloons in my jacket. <laughs> yes, but we know all about those. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, you mean uh, you chanced your arm you well, mean, Peter, because you um, you mean they weren't balloons? What's that? <laughs> they were not balloons then. Were what? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking no. about the little captions in cartoons now. No. Um, Peter, Will you please tell me what the subject is? Because I, I got no clue from the previous speakers. <laughs> <laughs> worry there's only one second left the subject is superstitions and you start now good luck mate <laughs> so it shows you that it pays to chance your arm because you I, you get the points and you create the entertainment which what just a minute is all about um so peter jones has moved forward he's now in second place behind derek nimmo clement freud in third place kenneth williams in fourth place and clement's turn to begin the subject cooking chicken kiev would you tell us something about that uh, clement in just a minute starting now cooking uh, Derek Nemo Chuck. Hesitation. Well, I'm afraid I must agree, because there's two seconds, complete two seconds on the clock here, so that must be hesitation. Derek, you have the subject, and there are 58 seconds for cooking chicken Kiev, starting now. First, kill your chicken, and then you have to prepare. Uh, Kenneth Williams is challenged. You don't have to kill the chicken to do this at all. Well, you can't cook no, it live, mate. It will be a, it'll he be is a... inferring that you first have to kill it. You don't, therefore it's devious to, to tell I this I can audience. tell you this, you couldn't make a chicken Kiev with a live chicken. Don't talk such rubbish. You can go into a shop and buy chickens. Of course you can. And they're not squawking, Do you mean if he, was asked, <laughs> if he was asked to make a rice pudding, would you say he has to go to Siam to pick <laughs> the <laughs> rice <laughs> up? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good point. Well, as Derek has just come back from Hong Kong, he's obviously got his rice, <laughs> and he probably came back via Russia to find out the correct recipe, and he wasn't deviating, and he has 55 seconds cooking chicken Kiev starting now. Getting off the Trans-Siberian Railway at Kiev, I wandered into a shop and purchased some butter and garlic to make my chicken Kiev. I rolled the garlic with some pate and froze the mixture very carefully in a refrigerator. Uh, uh, Clement Freud, a chance. Deviation, you can't roll your garlic. <laughs> <laughs> it was the mixture he was rolling. Mixture. Oh, he didn't say that. Yes, he did. He, he did. made the mixture. I rolled the garlic. In a said. pate. In a pate, he rolled it all. Butter. Like a marble. <laughs> you, yes, Come as out a, as and a, roll your as garlic. A, as an expert. Roll out your garlic. <laughs> well, I mean, to... I think probably it wasn't a bad effort, you know, on the railway station at Kiev, <laughs> <laughs> where apparently it was. <laughs> Can't be too particular under those circumstances. <laughs> uh, mind you... As an expert, Clement, it might turn you over, but um, it certainly didn't turn me on. But he wasn't deviating from the cooking a chicken Kiev, however revolting the end result might be. There are 39 seconds left for you to continue, Derek, starting now. Taking the flesh of the chicken, I wrapped it very carefully around what I'd already created. Um, Peter Jones, a chance. He said carefully before, when he, he was rolling the garlic. Yes, that's right. He, he did. He's been very careful, but he wasn't careful enough because he repeated himself. And there are 33 seconds for you... Peter, now to talk about cooking chicken Kiev starting now. You can stuff these chicken breasts with the frozen butter flavoured with garlic and then put them in an infrared oven which manages to cook it in a matter of seconds. And then if you serve it with the rice which you've previously bought at a shop, not grown, it can be a really delightful uh, dish. Uh, Clement Freud challenged. Deviation. Why? 
You've really got a deep-fry chicken, Kiev. You can't do it in a No, in a I microwave wouldn't agree. And anyway, if you're going to say that's true, I'm not going to disagree with you. So, <laughs> as a, as a, a cooking expert, Clement, no, but I, I know you're right. So there are 13 seconds for cooking chicken, Kiev, starting now. One of the great joys when you've cooked a chicken, Kiev... Uh, Derek Nimmo's chuck. He's talking about the joys after you've cooked a chicken Kiev rather than cooking a chicken Kiev. He wasn't Kiev. deviating from cooking chicken Kiev. One of the great joys after you've cooked no, a chicken of Kiev. Cooking of chicken. cooking. Of, I'm so sorry, Mr. Freud, I do retract. <laughs> Where does this sudden politeness come from all of a sudden? <laughs> Clement, you still have the subject, and there are nine seconds for cooking chicken Kiev starting now. It comes in not telling people what it is that you're putting before them as a result of which they plunge their knife into the breadcrumb mass and spoil their tie. Well, at the end of that round, uh, Clement Freud gained uh, some more points. One for speaking as a whistle when he's equal with Peter Jones, and there are five points behind Derek Nimmo, who's still in the lead. Uh, Kenneth Williams is trailing a little... But we have heard quite a lot from him. So, Kenneth, will you tell us something about George Peabody in just a minute, starting now? He was the most probably famous in Baltimore philanthropist ever born and was of considerable benefit to this city when he arrived here in the 19th century and appalled by municipal housing did a considerable amount to improve the lot of residents of that kind of property. He interested himself in Kane's expedition to the Antarctic and forked out to the tune of one and a half millions, which isn't bad when you come to think of it and know that money would be worth far more then than it is now. He also loved this city which we're all living in now and chose never to return to North America or the city in Massachusetts. I don't wonder, it's only because nobody else wanted the subject. <laughs> I know, but I don't wonder yourself. They're not generous on this lot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Kenneth Williams started with the subject of George Peabody and kept going with it for a full 60 seconds and told us something very mm -hmm. interesting about the American philanthropist and uh, he gained two <laughs> points and he's still in fourth place. <laughs> One for not being interrupted and one for speaking as the whistle went. Mm. By the way, you did convey, <laughs> Kenneth, that he gave one and a half million toward Kane's Arctic expedition. But it was just one and a half million I think he gave away overall. Why don't you shut your brow, you don't think? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just wanted to put the facts right the in case people... Start... I do of... get letters occasionally. They always think that there's some error. Well, they can shut not. their brow as well. I don't want to know. <laughs> Let them come up here and do I'll tell you this. Some I'm of them write to about that. You telling me to shut my brow, they do, you know. Well, that's one of those hazards. You see, this is the involuntary, isn't it? The program where you come out with it. You don't hold yourself in. <laughs> if it's all inhibited, if you don't let it hang out, then nothing would go on, would it? We'd all just sit here moaning exactly. at each other. And that's what I always reply, that part of Just a Minute is the fun that we have. Precisely. They all know that outside we're all great... No, you haven't bought me a drink for ages. <laughs> 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 Derek Nemo, let's get on with the game and ask you to begin the next round. The subject now is my advice to you. So you can take that in any way you like and you have just a minute in which to do it, starting now. Then my advice to you, Nicholas Barsons, is to clear off as quickly as you can <laughs> and wash off your street slap before you go down there because you'll be arrested, mate, or something nasty or somebody lit you with a handbag or something. Um, I never gave this a nasty... Kenneth the... Williams has challenged I you. cannot... Deviation. I cannot sit here and hear a chairman as fair-minded, as august, <laughs> as feminine as that. Abuse and I'm sorry, I think it's outside the rules of the game. I don't it, think it's It fair. was very devious, wasn't yes. it, Kenneth? And I quite agree Do my with advice to him. <laughs> and I will now buy you more than one drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a medium, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, you have a medium point. 
And you take over the subject of my advice to you with 45 seconds left, starting now. That line was once written from Queen Victoria to her daughter in Berlin. My advice to you is to be firm with Willie. The wedding will take place of the travel royal and not in Germany. It is not every day that a princeling marries the daughter of the Empress of India and the Queen of Great Britain. <gasps> Uh, Derek Nimmer has challenged. Um, with respect to Queens. Yes. I'm Queen afraid, Victoria um, and the Queen Victoria and Queen. The, you did repeat the Queen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm nonplussed. I mean, I just... Uh, words... I know, because you were going so beautifully and you were completely carried away. I could see it in your eyes. It was all flowing and you weren't aware of that fact. And it's very sad because you've been very generous to me for once. And, um, <laughs> but I have to be fair within the context of just a minute and unfortunately I have to give the subject back to Derek Nimmo which I really resent after what he just said <laughs> it shows you how fair I am and Derek you have 22 seconds to take up the subject of my advice to you starting now my advice to you dear people sitting in the audience tonight in the year of our Lord 1977 is to be nice and charming to everybody that you meet when you wander along the roads uh, Peter Jones has challenged well this isn't the year uh, 1977 uh, it is actually, Peter. Is it? <laughs> You've got to buy your diary. I know you what? have. I know you dozed off for a little bit then, but um, but you did perhaps think you were Last way year back was in 1976, uh, the 1976. I think it's 77 in most places. It certainly is here. So it was a wrong challenge. And there are ten and a half seconds. My advice to you, Derek, and if you knew what my advice to you was, um, you might be inhibited, but there are nine and ten seconds left starting now. To show consideration to our weak-minded chairman, because although he is not just a pretty face, in fact, his heart could be said of anything like that at all, <laughs> one should feel pity... I don't know what you were talking about then, but the audience laughed you. at the pretty face. Oh. Well, all right, pretty face, uh, Nimmo. Um, you have got a commanding lead. In fact, you've got twice as many points as Peter Jones and Clement Freud, who are equal in second place, and three times as many points as Kenneth Williams. Oh. If you want to do some arithmetic at home, you'll find out what the score is. And, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject is my natural habitat. <laughs> with a dirty laugh in the audience who doesn't think very highly of you, Peter. Um, yeah, there is just a minute in which to talk on the subject, starting now. Well, I suppose it's the stage doors, the dressing rooms, even the stages, West End theatres, the studios, the managers' offices, and, of course, the BBC canteen. Not the uh, Savoy Grill or the old fashioned great restaurants of the past. Romano's is one that springs to mind. That was never one of my natural habitats. But on the other hand, I am often seen in the small snack bars and take away... The Derek Nimmer has challenged. Well, he didn't take away the hesitation. No, he was going very well. I didn't yes. want to mention a brand name, actually. That was what I was... Well, he uh, wasn't very to... happy about it, but certainly he kept going. So, Peter, you continue with 28 seconds left on my natural habitat starting now. Pubs in both the saloon and private bars and cocktail places as well, of course. I hang around there always um, hoping Derek that Nimmer someone... Derek Nimmer challenged. Of course. Oh, yes, I'm with this one word and things. Of uh, course. Really do rotten. Work. I mean, it was just getting underway. It was getting nice, the cocktail bar. I was loving all that. I mean, it was getting really warmed up, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Well, I don't think he was very warmed up. I think he was a bit, um, he was a bit miserable about his natural habitat. But, um, anyway, no, you did repeat yourself, uh, Peter. So there are 21 seconds left for Derek Nimmo to talk on my natural habitat starting now. My natural habitat of the wild moors of northern Scotland, wandering along with my kilt swishing around my knees and my claymore by my uh, side. Clement Freud is charged. Deviation. Why? You wonder about in a kilt, not with a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if, you're wearing, if you're wearing trousers, you have to carry it. <laughs> he was wondering, but he did say with his kilt swishing around, which made... No, 
He also said he had his clay more by his side. That was the most <laughs> extraordinary thing. I know. <laughs> that was genuine uh, deviation. But, yes, um, quite. Um, Clement, I will give you um, the subject, and there are 11 seconds for my natural habitat starting now. My natural habitat are the Fenlands of Cambridgeshire, which are flat predominantly, although there is a hill 123 feet high in Haddenham. <laughs> Uh, Cameron Freud was then speaking as the whistle went. He gained an extra point, and with that flat comment of his, we have to bring the game to an end. Let me give you the final score. This week, uh, Kenneth Williams, who has been winning uh, once or twice recently, uh, I'm afraid finished in fourth place. He contributed his usual value to the program, which we enjoy so much. Peter Jones, who contributed his wit and Bonhomie as well, um, in his natural habitat, uh, came in second place, one point behind Clement Freud, but they were all quite a way behind this week's winner, who is Derek Nimmo. <laughs> we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, the Battle of Wits, a verbal... Uh, ingenuity and will want to join in again at the same time, not join in, <laughs> join us again at the same time next week when we will have as usual four panellists and myself trying to keep order in just a minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Brow. present Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo and Kenneth Williams in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsman. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very warm reception and uh, welcome to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard from our announcer, we have our four regular male keen terrible competitors of the game. And I'm going to ask them to speak, if they can, for just a minute on some subject that I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject which is on the card in front of me. And we'll begin the show with Derek Nimmo, and the first subject is The Friendliest One I Know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds as if he might be in the audience. Derek, would you talk on that subject for just a minute, starting now? I've always had a great affection for marsupials, that curious kind of mammal that's found only in Australasia and indeed in one part, I think, of South America. And the friendliest one that I know is the koala bear, a dear little creature which has a pouch, as indeed all this particular kind of creature has. Um, Clement Freud has challenged. Two creatures. Yes, there were two creatures. So, Clement Freud, you have a point for a correct challenge. There are 41 seconds left, and you take over the subject of the friendliest one I know starting now. The friendliest Derek Nimmo I know is the one who lives in southwest London and wears rather smart blue suits and affects this extraordinarily breathless accent, whereby you always think that you've heard what he said before, although the words that he employs may possibly be different. <laughs> the other friendly people, Kenneth Williams, kisses my ear on all possible occasions, which is not so much painful as embarrassing and very difficult to explain away to the people of Cambridgeshire who come to me and say, 
Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, he said people twice. Yes, he did, Peter. And you have the subject now with a point for a correct challenge. And there are only four seconds left. The friendliest one I know starting now. Well, it's a pub in St. John's Wood and it has the most delightful... <laughs> Messeders in fine whistle blowing style tells us that 60 seconds is up, and as you probably know, whoever speaks at that moment gains an extra point. It was Peter Jones. He has the lead at the end of the first round, and I'm going to ask him to begin the second round. Peter, a lovely subject. Martins. Will you talk about that in just a minute, starting now? Oh, I don't see anything very lovely about it. However, there are birds, <laughs> and they look uh, rather like swallows. The uninitiated might think they were. They probably belong to the same family. They live in holes in the sandy cliffside, and they eat insects, and they kind of make a great fuss about... Uh, uh, <laughs> Derek Nimmer has challenged An Hesitation. Right? I couldn't hear Derek. Hesitation. Um, yes, I think there was. I think he was actually coming and, uh, to a halt. He's getting a bit lost in the sand dunes with his pine martins there. Uh, Derek, you have a point, and uh, for a correct challenge, there are 40 seconds for martins starting now. Well, there are indeed sand martins, but of course, house martins are a very particularly nice form of this bird. And I once went to a house in. Uh, South Africa, which... And uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Hesitation. Not I hesitation. Into... No, I thought you were going to have repetition for house, but uh, you were wrong. He didn't hesitate. 29 seconds for Martin's Derrick starting now. Oh, Martin Robertson Justice was a very odd name to have for somebody who was a greyhound, but I entered him in the 3.30 at Norwich, and he ran a wonderful race, and to everyone's uh, surprise... Clement Freud has challenged. Deviation. Why? There's no afternoon greyhound racing in Norway. <laughs> well, as I know, I said, if I may say, Mr. Chairman, I did yes. say to everyone's surprise. And as there wasn't a 330 in Norwich, that's why they were surprised. No, no, you can't wriggle out of it that way now. No, no, you made your statement and you have to stand by it. And um, I know that Clement Freud is right and he has a correct challenge of point and... 18 seconds for Martin's starting now. I actually had an elderly uncle called Martin who invented a new kind of toothpaste, which was quite simply called Martin's, and a dentifrice to reach the market as this one did, including all the same ingredients as all similar paste. And uh, Derek Nimmo challenged. Repetition of all. Yes, all and you've got in with only half a second to go, Derek, with a repetition. Subject is Martin's starting now. Sir so Martin Gilliam. Yes. The uneven applause there was not because they didn't wish to clap for Derek Nimmo, I'm sure. It was just because they thought he didn't deserve it for such a, a small contribution, but it was. To... <laughs> but um, it does let people know what that the whistle's gone. What a monstrous remark. <laughs> it's in keeping with some of the ones you said about. You've really got a time, quarter of a it? second to speak. You can't make a very large contribution. I can remember. <laughs> I can cast my mind back to about 13 weeks ago when I had to step onto the... <laughs> And I was called a loud-mouthed oaf or something and mm. glaring across the Nothing thing. Nothing has changed then. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Clement Freud. All is forgiven. Right, let us continue. But before I do, I will tell you that uh, Derek Nimmo has a quite a strong need at the end of the round. Clement Freud, will you begin the next round? Hangover cures. Can you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? One of the best hangover cures that I ever had was performed upon me in Berwick on Tweed on the borders and consisted of several people watching most carefully while I was asked to step into an ice-cold river, as a result of which I became a cold stream guard. <laughs> Derek Nemo has a chance. Well, two colds. No, cold stream. stream is not um, is not a separate word. So no, it but wasn't. It was, um, I thought at the time it was going to be. Yes, yeah, so I know. Derek on as far as cold stream. So uh, well, listen, but incorrect. So um, Clement keeps the subject for and a point for a wrong challenge. Thirty nine seconds are left for hangover cures starting now. There is something which comes from the east called 
A... And Peter Jones. Hesitation. I would agree, Peter. And so you have hangover cures, and there are 35 seconds left, starting now. The best hangover cure I know is a fortnight in the south of France. If it's in the <laughs> summer, in the winter, then the Bahamas or Jamaica. Because obviously to get a hangover, you must be extremely rich, and you can well afford this extravagant cure. And while you're there in one of these sunny places, you can drink fruit juice, you can lie in the sun and bask in the sea, and this will do you the world of good because it'll refresh you, it'll get the alcohol out of your system and you'll be able to get the blood corpuscles coursing round your body as they've never done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a magnificent effort, Peter, which the audience obviously enjoyed, but it's the picture of you basking in the sea, which even the audience picked up, but the others let go. But, um... Shark a shallow part, you know. Mm. He doesn't look like a shark to me. Oh, you haven't seen it with the money, dear. <laughs> Jones, you did well in that round. Uh, getting the extra one for speaking as the whistle went, you've moved forward into second place, only one behind Derek Nimmo, our leader, and Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject, ha-ha, I see why Ian Messer has oh. thought of this. It's something you say often in the programme, my proclivities. Will you tell us something about my proclivities in just a minute, starting now? These generally mean your tendencies and which way you are bent. I always... <laughs> that mine are particularly given to gestures which are largely traceable to impatience. I am not someone who is a patient person. Uh, Derek Nimmo. Retract. Yes, because you thought he <laughs> patient, said patience. Patient. It was impatience and Well, you've simply yes. earned me a point, Derek, yes, and I am no. grateful to you. <laughs> I am beholden to you. Right. Contain your proclivities. Gather your forces again. There are 40, 39 seconds left. My proclivities starting now. And at school, the master said... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. I wanted him to be beholden to me as well. <laughs> And you said it so charmingly, you endeared yourself to every member of this audience. And Kenneth Williams has another point, a beholden Good. point. And there are 37 seconds, my proclivity is starting now. In my youth, I was commended for artwork. They said, you've got the knack, you've got... They did. Come <laughs> and try. Repetition of you've got. Yes, you've got too much there, mate. I'm sorry. And Clement Freud had a correct challenge, and there are 30 and one half seconds for my proclivities starting now. My proclivities are total reliability and punctuality. <laughs> Perhaps impatience would have to be one of my proclivities, because I do find it terribly difficult to be kind to fools. Nicholas Parsons himself would have noticed this on frequent <laughs> occasions. But by and large, when idiots come up to me and say, I thought you were taller than you are, or haven't I seen you on telly, or predominantly as your dog? <laughs> well, I'm reluctant to tell you after those remarks that Clement Freud made that he did keep speaking until the whistle went and gained an extra point, and he's now equal in the lead with Derek Nimmo. Derek, we're back with you, and the subject is lines. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Well, thanks to the Battle of Waterloo, the thin red line that was drawn up against the French, led by the Duke of Wellington, of course, at that time he was just Marlborough, and the splendid commander of the cavalry, the Marquis of Anglesey by name, Paget. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation, the famous thin red line drawn against the enemy was not at Waterloo, it was in the Crimea. Mm. It has nothing to do with Waterloo, and it's extremely devious, this whole account, because it was the squares which held uh, the yes. English at Waterloo, it was nothing to do with a thin red line. And it was only one line. <laughs> oh, yes, that's true, yes. yes. Well, anyway, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge. You have 43 seconds for lines starting now. The ones I know best are the Great Western Railway, and many's the time I've travelled on that wonderful locomotion <laughs> method. <laughs> What's the matter with you? What's the matter now? Who's, who's doing it? Clement Freud is doing it. on Deviation. Button. Why? You can't travel on a locomotion method. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, really I, I think whatever score, you were, you were in difficulties and Clement got in with the correct challenge. 32 seconds for lines, Clement, starting now. 
My favourite. And uh, Peter Jones. Very slow off the mark. Yes, hesitation. <laughs> right, right, yes, very hesitation. Yes, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> His locomotion was not all for that hot. Uh, Peter, there are 30 and one half seconds for lines starting now. Well, there are all the underground railway lines. There are the yellow parking lines. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Two there are. I know, rotten challenge, but he'll Good have to job. have it. <laughs> you have a point and 25 seconds. Lines starting now. And bowling along on the Cornish Riviera Express, I used to say to them, bring your best wine list to me, for I shall uh, choose Clement something. Freud is challenged. Deviation. Why? Well, they only just have one wine list. <laughs> <laughs> the concept that they have a good wine list and a bad wine list. I think you've got it wrong, dear. I was discussing the Great Western Railway, about which you have little experience. The Cornish Riviera Express. The Great Western I started off with. The Great yeah, Western yeah, Railway. Just... It doesn't exist today. Can... So how the hell do you know? Can... What <laughs> keep your adrenaline under control, please. His challenge was for the wine list, which was deviation. I agree with Clement. It's a good challenge. They don't have more than one wine list on any railway. Then he wouldn't now. even ask for that. I've been in places where he can ask me to have a drink. He's never done anything like that. <laughs> well, I was going to go to a small sherry. I yeah. was, honestly. <laughs> yes. Well, you look a bit like ones, but we'll... Um... Uh, Clement, a correct challenge. There are 18 seconds. Lines starting now. An extraordinary usage of the word lines now describes things that grocers have upon shelves. And you say, excuse me, do you carry this? And they say, it's a line which we have discontinued. It's an extraordinary thing. That... And Derek Nimmo. Well, isn't it extraordinary? Yes, that is right. <laughs> Four seconds are left. Another point to you, Derek. <laughs> the so the headmaster could... brought me into his study and said, Nimmo, you will have to write 500 lines before tomorrow morning. We have a very keen contest this week. Derek Nimmo is fighting back, having got a strong lead at the start. He's now back in the lead with Clement Freud, who had just previously overtaken him. Uh, Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. You're not far behind them. The subject is backgammon, and there are 60 seconds starting now. Well, I think you've deliberately chosen that subject because you know I'm not good at games, and I know nothing at all about backgammon. But I can only separate the word into back and gammon, and I think of ham, and which can be cooked quite well with pieces of pineapple and uh, back which... and uh, Kenneth Williams and uh yes because when he said ham of course he automatically thought of Derek Nimmo mm. and he didn't like to say it he's too polite um, there are 43 seconds backgammon is the subject Kenneth and you have it starting now for the domain I got from your famous tin salmon and the fortune I lost when you taught me backgammon and for making my uh, <laughs> Clement Freud challenge uh. Hesitation. Well, I, I had to because I realised the word was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pleased. We will give a prize at the end of the series for the first uh, postcard with the correct word that we <laughs> didn't say. And we'll continue with just a minute. And uh, there are 34 seconds for Backgammon Clement starting now. Backgammon is becoming an extraordinarily popular game which is played on a board with 30 pieces, 15 of which are white, and a similar number are red in colour. And the two opponents who sit opposite each other use dice and decide whether to start by the number thrown and thrown... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. A repetition of number. Yes. There are 12 seconds left for backgammon with you, Peter Jones, starting now. Well, I really know very little more about backgammon. Uh, David Nimmo, Chuck. In addition of no. I didn't know very much about it at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be mean, Kenneth. Just because he had a direct challenge. There are nine seconds backgammon, Derek, starting now. I went to the backgammon championship held recently at the Labrook Club, and there I found an assortment of old chums who, it turned out, they could play most extraordinary <laughs> well. I... Well, Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud are still battling out the lead. Derek's one ahead of Clement, but uh, Peter Jones is only three behind our leader, and Kenneth Williams is five behind our leader. In fact, he's half the number, so you can work it out. He has five, and Derek has ten. Clement Freud, will you begin the next round, please? The subject, shockers, with 60 seconds now. Shockers are words that tend to make people pull up in their traces, blush, blanch, or possibly go some other colour of the rainbow, 
which are, of course, vowels in uh, the Derek Nimmer. <laughs> well, blanche is not a colour of the rainbow, so you can't be to some other colour of the rainbow. Oh, yes, other colour than blanche, which is not a colour of the rainbow. <laughs> Some other colour of the rainbow is what no, it is. You certainly it. cannot go all those colours of the rainbow. Yes, you can. <laughs> They're violet, indigo, blue, green, <laughs> yellow, orange and red. <laughs> when you come to think of it, I suppose, according to the disease you've got or the illness you have or the shock you've had, Clement Freud has a dubiously correct uh, a line of thought. So we allow him to keep the subject and there are 47 seconds for shockers starting now. One of the most appalling shockers I've ever come across accosted me in Sackville Street in the southwest part of the West End of London. Uh, Derek Nimmer, Charles. Revolution of West. Yes, I think West. Southwest is, is hyphenated, right? No, it is. <laughs> southwest is not hyphenated. Oh, it's doubtful. It is very so doubtful. Southwest is doubtfully well, hyphenated. <laughs> yes. Can you please pull yourself together? There are 37 seconds for shockers, Derek, starting now. One of the most awful shockers that I ever witnessed was when I saw a man turn all the colours of the rainbow, which you can remember by saying Richard of York gave battle in vain, and then you can turn the colours round in the way that Mr. Freud is recently described. And Clement described. Freud challenged again. Repetition of colours. That is right, Clement, and you have the subject back <coughs> of shockers, and there are... Uh, 23 seconds left, starting now. Sneaking up to me on platform 14 at Paddington Station, this shocker grabbed at my inner leg and putting his left finger into my right pocket, extricated the only 20-pound note which was still then in my possession. You shocker! I said to him, calling the police, even at that same moment, and a constable... <laughs> What a fascinating life you lead, Clement. And Kenneth, we're back with you to start. Now, the subject that Ian Messeder has brought along for you to talk about, and we hope you know something about it, we know you like history, it's Queen Hatshepsut of 1600 BC. Do you know anything about her? But if not, try to tell you your about... pronunciation's all wrong. <laughs> well, you give us your pronunciation. Hatshepsut. I'm sorry? Hatshepsut. I was trying to mute. help you. Yes, Hatshepsut. Mm. You always say Hatshepsut. Just like Thothmes, it's uh, Totmus. I know. Queen Hatshepsut of 1600 BC. <laughs> Starting now. Hatshepsut was married to her father under the most extraordinary arrangement, uh, which was prevalent then with the pharaohs of Egypt, and he married her in turn to uh, his Clement son. Clement Freud well, incest was bad enough, but she's now married him twice. And that's what she did, too, in life. <laughs> yes, that's what happened but in you life. Did, you did repeat the word married. All so. right, you'll let him have it. <laughs> Queen Hatshepsut of 1600 BC, Clement. And there are 48 seconds left, starting now. The only time I ever saw a picture of Queen Hatshepsut was in a portrait gallery in Leipzig. Who is this? regal lady, I asked the museum keeper, and he said... And Derek Nimmo challenged. Well, I mean, it's quite, it's totally deep. I mean, there wasn't a painting of it was 1,600 years B.C. But, it, yes, but there still could have been a also, painting done... Also, he said museum later. twice. You could have got him on that. Mm. But he but one, If you agree with Derek's challenge, you cheer with him, and if you're with Clement Freud, you boo for him, and you all do it together now. <laughs> it's a draw. <laughs> I'm going to give the subject back to Kenneth Williams, as it's his subject originally. <laughs> and he's brought a lovely little flush and smile to his face. And uh, he will continue for 34 seconds, starting now. Hatshepsut not only did marry these two... Uh, <laughs> no, I said married before. I said marry this time. That's perfectly right. Thank You've got another point there. Thank you very and, much. Um, <laughs> You have 30 seconds, starting now. Our chefs had also acted as regent. Um, Clement Freud. Repetition of also. Yes. What a rotten challenge. He has another point. And you continue for 27 seconds, starting now. She opened the famous turquoise mines at Margaree and organised an overseas and marine expedition to Punt. In <laughs> now known 
as modern Somaliland. And before they left, she gave them a form of address which could be called exhortatory and said, Go at it, lads! Get into those boats, pull those oars, and really let's have it. <laughs> Well, I think that was a popular awarding of points <laughs> and uh, a great success on Kenneth's part as he kept going with the subject, getting the extra point when the whistle went. He's in third place, and, uh, but he's catching up on Derek Nimmer, who's two points behind our leader, who is still um, Clement Freud. And Derek, your turn to begin. And the subject is, my favourite words. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? My favourite words in <laughs> and... <laughs> 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 Yes, I agree, <laughs> Kenneth. There's a question. And you have another point. And you have uh, 58 seconds, a very sharp challenge, but you've now got the adrenaline going, the bit between your teeth and everything else, and we'll see you move forward on my favourite words starting now. My favourite words include plum and pandiculate, gum Phosis and kumquats. What delicious fruit they are, and how the name conjures up a vision of old Cathay. Orders change and yield their place to new, and fashionable words cease to be in vogue. Thus we find diligent is dropped. What's the matter with you? <laughs> how can I keep doing that waving? <laughs> what? <laughs> No, I'm... I'm... He's ruining me, Nick. He's just been waving and... He's been ruining you. He's ruined my only chance I've had of success. Are we here to play this game properly or yes. not? I mean, I just want to know where I stand. Kenneth! <laughs> I mean, Kenneth! Treat him. Kenneth, three things. First of all, don't play to the audience. Secondly, you're not standing, you're sitting. And if you haven't been ruined by now, you should have been. <laughs> and and not thirdly, somewhere. Thirdly, thirdly, I'm not going to allow the challenge. Kenneth, you have another point. 16 seconds. My favourite words starting now. And now the threat has gone from me. And though Herman the Freud words challenge. which would have sprung into my lips had Kenneth. I been given the Kenneth. opportunity... Kenneth, would you let the words not spring? Because Clement did challenge you a little while ago. It's a repetition of thread and of words. Yes. Uh, my well, words are on, on the card. On the card. Yeah, thread. I didn't say thread before. Yes, no. I've never said the word thread. Absolutely. <laughs> he never, never said the word thread. thread. <laughs> Thank you. He said he lost his thread before when the game wasn't on. No, you have another point. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Fourteen seconds. <laughs> My favourite words starting now. Words crack and break under the strain, as T.S. Eliot put so remarkably well, that dilemma which faces all men of letters, would-be authors, writers, monkey. <laughs> Well, that big cheer and prolonged applause probably uh, is because our audience here realised that Kenneth had really achieved something with that tremendous flourish at the yes, end. Yes, yes, yes. Shut up. It's true, I was marvellous. Contain Go on, yes. yourself. Because yes. I have to wind up the show and say that Peter Jones this week came in fourth place. Yes, fourth, a little behind. Fourth. Shut up. Yes, in the fourth. Go on. Fourth. A little way behind Derek Nimmer, who was in second place. He's only second, yes. yes. <laughs> Two points behind Clement Freud, yes. who was in third place. Third, yes. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons won the show this week. <laughs> no, this week, one point ahead with that final flourish coming from fourth place to first place, Kenneth Williams. Yay! We do hope that you've enjoyed just a minute and will come and support not only Kenneth Williams but everybody else in this show on some other occasion. We do hope the listeners have enjoyed the programme as much as we've enjoyed playing it to them and you want to tune in again. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Brown.
Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, Dr. Magnus Pike and Kenneth Williams in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome back Dr. Magnus Pike as our guest this week with Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones and Kenneth Williams. And they're all going to try and talk, if they can, for just a minute on the subject that I'll give them without hesitation, without deviation and without re relaxation. I was going to say that's the first subject. <laughs> without hesitation, without repetition and without deviation. The subject to begin with is relaxation. And we're going to begin the show with Derek Nimmo. And Derek, would you start now? Relaxation is something which I try very hard to find. My wife is often suggesting to me that I should go into the garden and do something relaxing. What she has in mind is chopping down assorted trees and digging trenches and planting bulbs. And at the end, when I came in, she said, what a very nice relaxing day you've had. I, on the other hand, do not find that to be so and have to go off to a health farm from time to T-I-M-E where I am lying on a bed drinking lemon water and getting underwater massage. It was absolutely marvellous. I first had one in Bangkok and it was lovely. But you can have them in the more respectable places in England and these I tend to be sent to by my aforementioned bride. I think this is rather a boring subject, really. <laughs> Maybe that is because uh, relaxation is taking over me and I am beginning to go to sleep <laughs> at... <laughs> 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 Well, Derek Nimmo put everybody into such a relaxed frame of mind. They didn't challenge him for some of the uh, crimes of the game that he um, committed, but he did jolly well. Derek, you did magnificently. You kept going for 60 seconds. You get a point for that, and also a point for speaking as the whistle went, which tells us that the 60 seconds is up. So at the end of that round, Derek Nimmo has two points, and it, nobody else has yet to score. Nobody else has yet to score. <laughs> nobody else has yet to speak. No, yes, <laughs> I... Exactly. I couldn't get a point for that, could I? <laughs> no, yeah, I'm sorry, Magnus Pike. You can't get a point for that, but it was a good attempt, and one person appreciated it. Um, Peter Jones, <laughs> will you take the second round? The subject is migration. Would you talk on migration for just a minute, starting now? It's one of the great mysteries. I dare say Magnus Pike probably knows the answer to it, but not many people do. How these tiny birds, like swallows, for instance, all manage to get together at a certain time of year and decide when to leave and in which direction to go. And then when they arrive, they remain there for a certain period, and then... All of a sudden, they are congregating anew and making the return flight with their progeny. And there, when they arrive, they build little uh, mud... I think we had two arrives, didn't we? He did have two arrives, yes, yes. yes. And at last, we've had a challenge in just a minute. First time it's happened, one and a half rounds gone, and our first challenge, it was Magnus Pike who did so, and the subject is migration. There are 25 seconds left, Magnus, starting now. Oh, I'd like to tell you about the sheer water that starts up in Alaska, and it flies right down across the globe and ends up in Tasmania, and it arrives so punctually that the people who are going to can it and eat it can order up all their supplies exactly on the day, and then you can eat the stuff. Oh, I've just said, eat, oh, but eat is only three letter word. I'm allowed that, aren't No, you're not. And then they fly back the other way, right through Africa. It's a most extraordinary what, thing. What, in tin cans? No, not the ones that are not in tin cans. <laughs> <laughs> no, Magnus, I think you've seen the man a slight misapprehension. Three or four letter words, you can be challenged if you repeat them. What, what about the? Well, yes, but we, if you keep repeating the, you'll be challenged, but they'll probably let you have... Eat, 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 you eat. Eat is a very positive, uh, one of the most positive nouns, uh, verbs. If I nouns, ate in a very relaxed way, would you let me off? You eat in a relaxed way. Well, I mean, way. he was relaxed and... Oh, never mind. No, I, I won't protest. No. You're doing exactly what they all do, trying to argue your way out of it, but I'm afraid well, you no, have I'm quite happy because I think I've told them about this marvellous bird, the shearwater, and it's very, very interesting. Mm. And there are eight seconds left for... They Derek call Nimmer. them the mutton bird when they eat them in Australia, and it's very strange. They do taste like mutton. Do they? And you know the reason is because they have so much fat on their muscles that mm. they, they are like mutton because yes. they've got to fly all the way to Alaska. No, the subject what is migration. Yes, indeed. All right, And there yes. are eight seconds left starting Because now. they saw the cuckoo flying south, and then they followed this bird 
who was migrating to uh, New Zealand. <laughs> So on this occasion, Derek Nimmo was speaking uh, once again as the whistle went and gained an extra point for doing so. He's increased his lead at the end of the round. Uh, Magnus Pike. You're not very nice, you know, Mutton Bears. Did you think so? I didn't like it. Magnus, would you like to have your... I do it, but I didn't yeah. like it much. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to have a chat after the show? No, no, yes, of course. Because well, I think a lot of the audience would like us to play just a minute. Of course, like you are And maybe some of the listeners as well. What's my subject now? Endangered species who people like... The subject, Magnus, is the Zeman effect. The Zeman effect? Yes. Do you want me to talk to you about that? We'd love you to talk to us about the Zeman effect in just a minute, starting now. Right. Piet Zeeman was a Dutch physicist who in 1896 discovered the Zeeman effect. If you take some sodium light, which is yellow, and you put it between the poles of an electromagnet, the beam is expanded, and more than that, the, it becomes polarized. Because normally illumination is all over the world, a little muddle, but when it goes through the Zeeman effect, yes. it's all straight up and down. Did anybody ring? Or yeah, yes, sir, Derek Nimmo rang you Why up. Why did you ring? Self-protection again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I didn't point to that, because that's not good. One gets a bit apprehensive here. When, uh, so what is your challenge, Derek? Well, the Zeeman was affecting me, basically. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But it was a hesitation, but I, oh, I'm no, not really bothered. Oh, no, you can't say that. No, all right, I can't say that. It's quite no, right. I won't no, there was it. a There was a repetition of... Uh, That's what I thought, actually. Yes, but, but you mean. didn't say it. You said, uh, um, I said hesitation. Well, I do... I mean, you... Uh, can I be hesitation oh, no, repetition? no, it was a demonstration. He was making a demonstration and repeating oh. a certain vowel sound. No, I think it's very valuable to get... We've got uh, getting education as we go on. It's very yeah. nice to have a distinguished sound. I didn't science. know that it went... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Magnus, will you continue to educate us in 35 seconds on the Zeeman effect starting now? Indeed, I will do my best to educate you, but under the terms of just a minute, it's very difficult to do because you may not repeat essential words for the explication of the extraordinary, mysterious nature of the physical principle which you're trying to elucidate. And if that fellow doesn't ring that stopwatch before long, come <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones challenged you. Uh, deviation. He's well, talking about the stopwatch. Yes, yes, you're quite right. I was trying to bring in the word polarization without repeating it. And it's impossible, oh. isn't it? Yes, well, actually, you'd lost my interest a moment or two before <laughs> that. <laughs> I know I should never have come. <laughs> <laughs> then you, you, you mentioned, I think the show would have been the loss. Uh, we would have lost a lot if and you had referred to then. this fellow. That is Ian Messiter, the creator of this game. <laughs> You're referring to as this fellow. Yes. Um, uh, Peter, you have the subject, and you have 18 seconds, the Zeeman effect, starting now. Well, the wonderful actors in the BBC rep are called upon to play many different parts, like waiters, Italians, Spaniards, and sometimes seamen of Cornish descent. <laughs> If they're not natives, they fall back on Mama Set, and they say the Zima are coming, and they're coming well in a bit. So then, Peter Jones was speaking as the whistle went, gained that all-important extra point, and has been now in second place behind Derek Nimmo. Magnus Pike trails one point behind, and then Kenneth Williams has yet to score, to my surprise. So, Kenneth, you begin the next round. The subject is Mother's Birthday. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? My mother's birthday falls on the 20th of December, 1901. I'm sure she wouldn't mind my revealing that fact, because someone pointed out she's always two years younger than the year date, which I thought was very interesting. Not Mag two years younger than the year date. Yes, he did That's say... two the years, word. isn't Yes, it? there's two years there. No, so I said years than the year yeah, date. That, yeah, but it's the word year with an apostrophe, yes, so you still repeated the word year. And it sounds as much like it Not as Zeman sounds apostrophe like Zeman. Yes, it's years. There's no apostrophe. Oh, years yet. date. Oh. As a phrase, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the date of the year, which you could say the year's date. Um, 
you have to listen so hard, you don't realise how much... Uh, uh, there are 44 seconds, Kenneth, to continue on Mother's Birthday, starting now. Oh, Lou, I said to her, because she was christened Louise Alexandra. Come through all those rains. No, I was quite dry, she said. <laughs> I meant the reigning monarch. Five in all. Imagine that, I said. Well, what would you like for a present, I said endearingly, which is one of the ways I get round people off and on. Mostly, of course. Uh, Peter Jones has chance. I just wanted to mention my birthday is June the 12th. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you very much, Peter. And oh, just for together. Kenneth's benefit. Yes, well... I'll remind Kenneth... you again, nearer the time, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kenneth gets another point for an incorrect challenge, and there are 14 seconds left for Mother's Birthday, starting now. On your mother's birthday, I pointed out a gift is most acceptable. I said, what do you fancy? She said a few prawns. As they couldn't be, <laughs> as they couldn't be obtained fresh, they had to be tinned. And unfortunately, she contacted me. <laughs> I was going to say I... that they were tinned, and she got to main poisoning, so it wasn't a good idea. Either. <laughs> what a happy birthday! Well, I don't think whatever Kenneth Williams had done in that round, the audience would have let me take the subject away from him. So, um, which is, well, we didn't try. And uh, Kenneth gained four points in that round, one for speaking as the whistle went. He's moved into second place, one behind Derek Nimmo and one ahead of Peter Jones. And Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, Wells. Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? One of the difficulties the early Christian fathers found was removing the superstitions attached to wells from the old pagan religions that were in this country before St. Augustine came to Kenton. The whole spread of Christianity came throughout the British Isles. Well, it still survives in the way that we throw into a well money to wish ourselves good fortune and to bring prosperity upon us. But for me, one of the most beautiful wells in the whole of this country is the city of Wells itself. And I've often been asked to row around the moat of the palace there by the Bishop of Bath and Wells. And there it is. I never ever actually accepted this invitation, but it does attract me enormously because I particularly like the cloisters of Wells. They are the finest, I think, surviving of all the monastic institutions in this country today, and the great uh, Peter Jones has charged. Uh, repetition of country. Yes. You travel around the country yes, and you repeat... Absolutely right. Repeat. I'm first to sort of admit yes. when I'm wrong. And... <laughs> <laughs> magnanimous. Uh, eight seconds are left, Peter. Uh, Wells is the subject. Starting now. Well, we're all hoping that this country is going to be saved economically, at any rate, by the wells of oil in the North Sea. I... Peter Jones is now in the lead alongside Derek Nimmo, just um, followed by Kenneth Williams and Magnus Pike. And Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject is gluttony. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, it is, to my mind, one of the least attractive of the seven deadly sins, perhaps because it's usually practised alone. It's a lonely sort of vice. Not like, for instance, adultery, where you have to have a <laughs> companion <laughs> to share <laughs> the fun. Now, uh, Derek Nimmo challenged the deviation. Adultery is not one of the seven deadly sins. One didn't the... say it was. You did. It, unlike the... Well, I did imply it, did I must imply. admit, because I couldn't remember what the other deadly the other sins were. <laughs> You're really trying to think of lechery, that's the one. Lechery. You would have been okay then if you'd got into that. Yes. But Dr. Lechery. Magnus Pike's an authority on that, as you can see. Oh, it's the seven deadly sins, yes. But actually, yes, lechery, yeah, uh, lechery isn't one of the deadly sins. Well, sins. It's luxury is our polite no, term. No, no lust, you're thinking. Lust. Really, no, you'll find it. Yes, I don't like this. It's, it's, Pride. Look it up, don't you, Mr. Messenger. Look it up, you'll find it. Well, I only know one. four, you see. <laughs> gluttony, anyway. repetition, deviation, and hesitation. <laughs> Envy, pride, lust, um, gluttony, 
Um, well, lust isn't much yes. fun in joy Slope, alone, right. is it? Uh, literary, <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, Peter, I'm going to be generous to you. So, will you continue on gluttony with 39 seconds left, starting now? It is, briefly, the awful business of eating too much and then going on and having more, having seconds and stuffing yourself with every kind of food and drink. People make... Uh, um... <laughs> there it goes. Yes, yeah, you've got him this yes. time, definitely. There are 24 seconds for gluttony with you starting with now. With me? No, not with you, Magnus. Oh, I, just, I did ring my bell, but a little late, was it? No, you might have pressed mm. your buzzer, but you didn't ring any bells. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, Derek's buzzer light came up in front of me first, so Derek got in first, and there are 24 seconds left starting now. I've always wanted to be a glutton, to mass on a great table huge quantities of smoked salmon and turkey and mushrooms and tripe, onions, rabbits, Squirrels, pig cocktails, tongues, and mutton birds. How delicious they are when they fly into Tasmania. What's the matter with you? It's oh, Peter Jones' oh, Peter Jones. I didn't know. I was fascinated. Yes. <laughs> Peter. Well, <laughs> not... <laughs> Squirrels, I know what they're like. He would have had more than wind, I can yeah. assure you. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Squirrels are very indigestible. to cook, too, aren't they? <laughs> uh, Peter, let us get back to what your challenge was. It was, um... <laughs> <laughs> I know what it was. It was deviation. Why? Well, nightingales are protected birds, and even if he was <laughs> crass enough to try to eat nightingales' tongues, whatever that would be like, uh, he wouldn't be allowed to be arrested. But anyway, still, it's very it still bad. Would, it would still illustrate the point of gluttony he was making. He and, was talking uh, about his own personal ambition, which was pretty appalling. I must <laughs> It certainly blemished the Nimmo image as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and Squirrels and nightingales. <laughs> I mean, you know, what next? Yes, and together. Um, eight seconds are left on gluttony with you, Derek, starting it now. It has been said of a glutton that he is a man... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. If it's been said, he's repeating it. We don't <laughs> want to... <laughs> And you're quite right, Peter. He did use the word glutton before when he said at the beginning, I would love to be a glutton. Yes. And indulge in he all those squirrels. He didn't and... challenge on that score. Yes, he said it's repetition. That's what he challenged on. It's been said before. Repetition. It had been said ah. before. So uh, you have to be so sharp in this position that I'm in. Six seconds are left with gluttony and you, Peter, starting now. If you indulge in gluttony, one thing is for sure. You will get an awful lot of repetition. <laughs> 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 Peter Jones has now taken the lead. He's one ahead of Derek Nimmo, three ahead, uh, four ahead of Kenneth Williams, and six of Magnus Pike. Six? And, oh, gracious yes. me. Mm. I'm sorry you didn't ring in the Dormouse. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> the Romans used to eat it in their feet. To be in the lead. Mm. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've had witchetty grubs. Have you ever eaten a witchetty grub? Well, I've, 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 I've lectured about them. I think that's better than eating them. But they're, yeah, they're they're nice. you two they're finished your conversation? Go yes, of course. So please go on. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Most generous of you, Magnus. Would you begin the next round? The would subject I, would is. I begin? Yes, what it's what, your what, turn what? actually to begin. The subject is fixations. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Well, I'd like to tell you about imprinting, which is the same as fixation. Now, if you take a chicken just out of its egg, or you you take a little duck and you show it a tennis ball. It thinks the tennis ball is its mother. Don't, don't interrupt me. The tennis ball is its mother. And uh, then it calls it about wherever it goes. Now, Mary had a little lamb. Now, this is a case of, of fixation. Did yes, they but ring yet? They, they have actually buzzed you. Not uh, too many tennis balls. Peter Jones. Jones. Well, he said tennis ball was its mother twice. Yes, yes I'm I afraid did. you yes. did, yes. Uh, which seemed, uh, I would like to buzz, but he told me not to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, I yes. Try, really. I must explain to right. the listeners that Magnus Pike is sitting next to Derek Nimmo, so he can not only hit him when he wishes, but he can also ask him not to buzz. But uh, Peter Jones has actually buzzed but and has got... hitting I don't like, really. <laughs> I don't mind the hitting, actually, or even being told uh, not 43 to buzz, seconds, fixation Peter. Solidly, hour after hour. It just shows you <laughs> what scientists are doing in the privacy of their laboratories. <laughs> 
I've always suspected that they were up to this kind of thing, like showing innocent ducks and chickens tennis balls and persuading them that these are their parents. And this is how our, our money is wasted uh, by the official scientists. Derek Nimmo has Ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Derek Nimmo, you have the subject, and there are 21 seconds left. Fixations starting now. I have recently developed a curious fixation. I keep seeing Indian bus conductors walking past in front of me. <laughs> and I don't quite understand whether this is just an apparition or whether, in fact, Sikhs, Hindus... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. A repetition of weather. Yes, weather. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say there were different kind of weather. But yes, I must explain to the listeners that the person who walked out uh, was a bus conductor, <laughs> and that was the reason for. Um... I should explain to you, he's not walked out. He's gone to the gentleman's laboratory. <laughs> Kenneth, you had time to go and check during the last talk, did you? No, he, he, he mimed his intention to me. <laughs> <laughs> but now he's just mimed to me that he was feeding the meter where he parked his bus. So, um... Got to park his to... bus in a very peculiar place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> as long as he can get it out afterwards, I think we'll... <laughs> Mr. Parsons, we do not wish to know that. There are Antipodean cousins sitting in the front row. We don't want them to go back and tell those mutton birds the nasty things that they've been seeing. Uh, well, let us go back to just a minute. The subject is fixations. Who challenges it? Peter Jones, a repetition of weather. You see, I have to have a memory as well. And there are four seconds left, five seconds left, starting now. I don't know what the subject is. I've forgotten it so long ago. Derek Nemo challenge. Well, he's certainly not talking about the subject if he doesn't know what it is. I think he was illustrating uh, it. Fixations. Yeah, I think yes, that's it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, three I and a half Nick seconds left. Fixations speak. starting now. Once one gets this idea fixed in one's mind... <laughs> So at the end of that hilarious round, Peter Jones has increased his lead, including getting an extra point for speaking as the whistle went. And Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject is Isaac Walton. Will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? Probably most famous for The Complete Angler, which is a book all about fishing, which is interspersed with little homilies, awfully charming, is largely... It's uh, all about fishing. It can't be interspersed, can it? <laughs> because then it wouldn't be all about fishing. The interspersed homilies aren't about fishing. They're about all sorts of things. <laughs> Oh dear, what a difficult, uh, very clever... Well, I thought I'd better pop up. Very clever challenge. So easily bottled. Mm. And almost impossible on which to give a decision. So shall I put it to the audience, if you consider The that... book is about fishing and it's interspersed with homilies and it is a fact. And that is true whether he likes it or not. <laughs> so it don't matter what they say. <laughs> Whether he likes it or not, I still wish to be fair to our guest. Uh, I'm not Magnus. interested in what you wish to be fair to. <laughs> I'm, interested, I'm interested in being fair to myself. I've hardly got a word out in this show. It's an absolute yeah. disgrace, apart Watch from interpreting fingers. the mime of people leaving to go to the loo. I don't think that <laughs> The unfortunate thing is that you're often not interested, and that's why just a minute verges on the, the point of getting out of hand on occasions. I think I'll I... put in for conciergerie. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I'm going to let yours be the final decision, because Magnus Pike had a perfectly accurate decision, uh, though uh, Kenneth Williams had a very good point. If you agree with Kenneth Williams, would you cheer for him? If you agree with Magnus Pike, would you boo for him? And will you all do it together now? <laughs> I think the chairs have it. <laughs> In other words, you're completely biased and prejudiced. You want to hear from Kenneth Williams on Isaac Walton, and there are 54 seconds left, starting now. The reason he was so inspired to write the treatise was due to one Marmalina Ebeline, and he said, Oh, that I might plant an English kiss upon your lips. And she was delighted, and she let him do it not only on a aforementioned. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 bad luck, yes. Oh. Well, she did let him do it in all sorts of places. <laughs> 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 
But you I couldn't... Have... an interesting story about Evelina there. I know, and I'd rather have heard it than won this game. Oh. <laughs> But Derek's uh, challenge <laughs> was uh, an accurate one, and there are 34 seconds left for Isaac Walton, Derek, starting now. Well, Isaac Walton was very influenced by Dean Knowles, the distinguished divine who was at Westminster Cathedral in the 16th century, who was indeed a great fisherman as well, and uh, a fisher uh, of... Uh, Kenneth men. Williams. We are dealing with the Dean now. We're not dealing with Mr. Walton, I'm afraid. Uh, We're yes. off on the Dean of something or other, which really nothing to do with the subject, Quite and right, I do Kenneth. feel... Kenneth! <laughs> and of course, as he won, he erred, and of course, that was hesitation as well. So <laughs> there are 22 seconds for you, Kenneth, to take over the subject again of Isaac Walton, starting now. He's not so well known for the fact that his brother Arthur, who was sometimes called Art, and also had another name which was Easian, invented the Art Easian Well, which was <laughs> sunk. Absolute fact, it was sunk, and he got sunk with it, and was drowned. Uh, Derek Nimmo charged. Sunk twice. Yes, you were sunk by your own petard there. Um, there are... That isn't right. It wasn't Artesian, was it? <laughs> oh, it's true. <laughs> It's the same reason I said sunk instead of hoisted on his petard, you see. The, um, uh, so, uh, there are seven seconds for Isaac Walton with you, Dane Derrick, starting now. Isaac Walton. That is a name that I once saw imprinted upon a newspaper in Tehran. And the funny thing... <laughs> So, uh, I've just been told we have no more time to play just a minute. Magnus Pike returning in triumph, uh, um, uh, but against a very tough opposition who didn't give him any that. mercy. Yeah. Yes, they didn't give you any quarter, any mercy, but you contributed magnificently, and we loved having you on the programme, Magnus. You finished in fourth place. You came. A, That's a, not bad, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> not at all bad. Not at all bad. It's like the Oxford game is boat race. You can't be worse than second. It'd be a great achievement to get into fifth place. Uh, Kenneth was in third place. Uh, Peter Jones held the lead magnificently, but Derek Nimmo, with that last flourish, caught him up. And so we have joint winners this week, Peter Jones and Derek Nimmo. <laughs> we uh, do hope that you have enjoyed just a minute, enjoyed listening to it as much as we've enjoyed playing it, and will want to join in again at the same time next week. And once again, we take to the air and we play just a minute. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Browell. Present Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, and Kenneth Williams in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, hello, and uh, welcome to Just a Minute. And I'm sad to have to say this is the last... Uh, um, particular game in this series of Just a Minute. We've now come to number 26 once more, and we welcome back our four regular competitors of the game, so we're looking for an exciting and keen contest to wind up this year's series. And, as usual, they will try and talk for just a minute on the subject that I will give them, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card which is in front of me. And we'll begin the show, the last programme, and this is with Kenneth Williams. Who better? <laughs> Who better to begin with at any time? But, Kenneth, the subject is my dignity. 
So will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? It was gravely impaired quite recently in a vast London department store, which I shall not name in view of the BBC charter. Uh, Derek Nimmer has challenged. Repetition of B. <laughs> yes, that is a correct challenge. So, Derek... Uh, Kenneth of course Williams it's is not a correct chat. It's all about BBC. How else can you say? British Broadcasting British, British Corporation. British Broadcasting Corporation. Rubbish. That's not repetition to say BBC. Well, I don't know what is more repetitious than BB. Oh, don't be ridiculous. The repetition of a letter. The repetition of a letter. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back. The audience are certainly with you. And of course they are, but they know it was totally unfair to be told <laughs> to say B, B, and B. And I must say... It's repetition, it's Kenneth, ridiculous. Kenneth, you did repeat, and that is not permitted in the rules of just a minute, so I must be fair to Derek Nimmo and tell him he has a correct challenge. So he gets a <laughs> and our charming audience are showing that they're as partisan as usual when Kenneth Williams <laughs> plays up to them but I must stick to the rules as far as I possibly can. And Derek Nimmo, you have the subject, and there are 47 seconds. My dignity, starting now. My dignity was recently gravely impaired when I visited the Automobile Association, which is commonly known as the AA, back to Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> No, Never. I do it. no, I couldn't do it. I'm not, I'm not capable of challenging on those petty issues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, too, I'm too big a persona for that. You know, I'm general. Peter Jones has challenged. Well, I... I Hesitation. Actually, Absolutely yes. right. It's a long time since he spoke. I would like Den uh, Derek to go on with it because I want to hear about him joining Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. As Derek was generously trying to give it back to Kenneth, we stop the clock and we won't score any points. Leave it with Derek and tell you the 34 seconds, Derek, my dignity starting now. Oh, well, oh, good morning. Well, my dignity, gosh gracious me, I was standing in St. George's Cathedral in Hamburg one day and the man came up to me, smacked me straight across the face and said that you have no dignity. But he said it in German, which sounded very unpleasant at the time. And as I was sitting on the floor, I got up very quick and rushed to one of the yellow uh, and the guard. Jones has challenged. He said he was standing in the yes. cathedral. And and then, I um, got knocked down. Didn't no, but you did say then as I was sitting on the floor. Well, I was not as a result. Down. Yes, I know, but oh, you didn't I say you as a result to, of the you knock. You have to do the bit in between, do you? Yes, I see, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Jones, you have the subject. There are 19 seconds. My dignity is starting now. Well, any tourist who may be thinking of going to Hamburg and visiting the cathedral there will deserve... Uh, Kenneth Williams, a chance. Well, I mean, this is all about the cathedral of Hamburg. It's nothing to do with my dignity, is it? I mean, it's the no, no. Uh, 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 Derek did establish how his dignity was insulted. No, it's not Derek that's speaking. We're now to say he's a great fool. <laughs> <laughs> great well, he's, he's illiterate. He's illiterate as well as being an idiot. <laughs> Supposed to be ill. Look at him. He's white as sheet. Fetch him a tonic or something. You Give him some are weak Drop a port wine or something. Bring him round. <laughs> Kenneth, contain yourself. Still with Peter Jones to continue on my dignity starting now. I don't really, honestly, truthfully think of dignity as something that one should prize very highly. Because, after all, pride has got a great deal to do with it. One's position in life is it. So <laughs> Well, because of all the interruptions and the shenanigans of uh, Kenneth and others, uh, that was rather a long first round. <laughs> and the whistle told us that 60 seconds was up as usual, and whoever speaks at that moment, as you know, gets an extra point. And it was Peter Jones, who has a strong lead at the end of the first round. Uh, the next round, the subject is Mead, and Clement Freud, will you begin uh, 60 seconds, starting now? Mead. Uh, Peter Jones' challenge. Hesitation. I think you're right. Uh, yes, because actually three seconds had gone, so it must be hesitation. <laughs> I thought he died for a minute. <laughs> well, I, can, I can honestly say if three seconds went, I was asleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, the audience... I hope you're refreshed now. <laughs> yeah, sure. A short rest. Yes. Oh, and good evening. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Clement Freud has come back from the back benches and, um, <laughs> to life, and um, he's lost the subject. 
I hope it's Peter Jones has gained another point. And there are 57 seconds for Mead, Peter, starting now. Mead in Cornwall is known as the honeymoon drink. Whether or not it is an aphrodisiac, I'm in no position to judge. But I believe honeymoon couples are persuaded. Um, Clement Floyd challenge. Repetition of honeymoon. No, he said honey before. Not honeymoon. The honey drink. Definitely he said that. In spite honeymoon of... couples, the honeymoon drink. Uh, he said a honey drink. He said, oh, I, well, all right, I will... <laughs> I'm always prepared I to think admit... one of us ought to leave. <laughs> Shall we put and it I'm, to the audience which one? As, you, <laughs> as you've just been asleep, and I'm Mr. staying. Right. And as I'm always prepared to admit, if I make a mistake, and the audience seem to think that I have, I will bow to their superior judgment and uh, tell you that Clement Freud gets a point for a great challenge, and he takes over the subject of Mead again, having not spoken on it yet. <laughs> Work that one out, but it is accurate. And there are 47 seconds, Mead, starting now. The first girl I ever met had a slight cold and said to me, meet me at the public baths. <laughs> and I never realised until many years later that Mead was nothing other than a drink <gasps> of... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Hesitation. Nothing other yes, than... I think he was there. slowly, slowly yeah. sort of dragging to a halt. Hesitation. Nodding off again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Still hesitation. Definitely. I'm sorry, Clement. There are 34 seconds with you, uh, Derek, on Mead starting now. I once went to the Mead ceremony at Yant in Oxfordshire at West Mead and Pixie Mead. They have these 13 boards. It goes back to the 11th century. It's very interesting, actually. They... Uh, Clement Freud. Could you name the 13 boards? Yes. <laughs> What's that got to do with just a minute? Oh, past the Thirteen time. 13 <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud, we know you've been asleep twice, but do realise you are playing just a minute. You're not in the House of Commons. No, I mean... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are five balls playing this game. Balls, I... balls. The balls. Yes, you, balls. you need to balls. listen a bit better than me. You don't speak you do. <laughs> there are 26 seconds for Derek Nimmo to continue with the subject of mead starting now. It takes place every St. Peter's Day at the Grape Inn, and that accounts for the ploughing and grazing rights for the year. Of course, the drink itself I like very much. When one has a nice platter of food in front of one, a glass of mead in one's hand, you swig it down the throat and feel a wonderful sense of well-being, and otherwise you feel rather... No, but I won't say that, <laughs> but it's... <laughs> Field. Yes, that's right, Kenneth. There are five sec no, four seconds left for Mead with you, Kenneth, starting now. I was asked to have a drop by my agent, and I said I need someone to handle me. And he said, you're <laughs> fine, you're not better with a drop of mead. Well, uh, Kenneth Williams then was speaking as the whistle went. He got that extra point. He's one ahead of Clement Freud, one behind Derek Nimmo, and Peter Jones is still in the lead. Derek Nemo, will you begin the next round? The subject is rose, and will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? A rose beyond compare. Every year when I visit the Chelsea Flower Show in the Royal Hospital grounds at Randa, I go into the tent and see these beautiful roses with names like passion... Um, and like... Clement Freud. Did you see Ranala? Randa. Yes, he did. So That's what's wrong with, with that? the Chelsea Hospital grounds are? It is. It isn't. No. What is it then? <laughs> I thought they were in Chelsea. <laughs> what do they call them, though? What did you say? Well, isn't that at the bottom, the park called Rambler Gardens? No. The no, 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 no. They're in the grounds of, of Chelsea Hospital. No, no, the bottom part. The park is where they are, actually. Let's go. What's it called? Well, <laughs> go there, but I've never bothered to ask, am I Chelsea in the Chelsea Hospital, hospital or am I in the Ramble? Well, not in the Chelsea Hospital grounds, it's the park at the bottom, which I thought was Ramble Gardens. I will put it to the audience. Yes, yeah. then. <laughs> they don't know either, so we'll... Uh, well, I thought There's a lady there who knows. What is it, lady? Is he right? Yes. Yes. Well, good luck to you, darling. I'm glad you got it. <laughs> You obviously visit the Chelsea Hospital uh, regularly. His mother. Yes. Yes. Derek's mother. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> and her name is Rose. <laughs> a sprightly little Rose there. All right, so Derek, you keep the subject and there are 46 seconds on Rose starting now. 
Passion flower, succulent bee, lady chamberlain, potty's choice, green sour western. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Potty's choice is not the name of a road. No, oh, it isn't. <laughs> no it's green sour western. No, it isn't. Oh, well, no. I don't know about that. I know potty's isn't. No, no, potty's choice definitely isn't. There are thirty-six. <laughs> Potty's choice. No, I thought it had a flavour. It had a flavour, but it was the wrong flavour. It was an infantile game. It was not a rose. There are 36 seconds on rose with you. Peter, starting now. The rose I like best is the one at the end of the spout of the watering can. It's metal. It lasts much longer than these things that are growing on the end of stalks. And one can use it to... Uh, Derek Nimmo, challenge. Repetition of can. Yes, you've got to can. Oh. <laughs> Three-letter word. <laughs> yes, but you use it as a, as, a, as a verb and as a noun. And exactly, I showed <laughs> the variations <laughs> possible. But you didn't illustrate that as you did it. No, I'm sorry. It, the, the rules adjustment are you cannot repeat the word, which you did, unfortunately. So Derek gets rose back, and there are uh, 22 seconds left, starting now. Cod's rows are a particular favourite of mine. And also, <laughs> I'm sorry, when I look at the audience tonight, I can also see rows of apparently similar... Uh, Clement Freud. Reputation of also. Oh, yes. that's a tough one, isn't it? When I say also. Yes, yes you did say also at the beginning and also just then. So, uh, going to... Oh. I. Well, I'd never... <laughs> <understand>. <laughs> so, Clement Freud's mother's in front as well. <laughs> But as he repeated the word, it is a correct challenge, and Clement, you have now 14 seconds to talk about rose starting now. There's a saying which goes, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. And we had a woman by that who worked for us who smelled absolutely terrible. <laughs> William's challenge. We had a woman by that. I don't understand deviation, I would thought. We had a woman by that. By that name. Oh, the same I, name. By, couldn't we had a woman. I name. thought you were challenging on two smelts. Actually. But to have a woman by that has a totally different connotation. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I had said Doesn't name make... previously. Well, then you should have been more inventive and thought of something else, shouldn't you? Rather? <laughs> well, you so could have challenged. You are challenging on deviation of grammar, Kenneth. Mm. No, he wasn't. And you have four seconds to continue with the subject of rose. Not continue. Take over the subject of rose, starting now. I rose in the early morn, making forth clarity in the mylode and two <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be pretty level pegging score-wise in this week's uh, Just a Minute. Uh, Derek Nimmo's now in the lead with Peter Jones, and Kenneth's a little behind, and Clement Freud, for once, is in fourth place. Uh, Peter, will you begin the next round? The subject is success. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Success has nothing to do with the acclaim of the public or even the critics. It is something that one feels very occasionally inside one's own heart, if one listens very carefully. Uh, Derek Nimmo oh, challenge. I mean, two ones and another one. I, mean, I, I know, goes, but, but it was one such, one. A, such a you true would need a cardiograph. Well, he, he, what, sir? You would need a cardiograph to listen to your own heart. <laughs> but what he the said deviant. had a ring of truth, which oh. I heartily endorse. But it was a repetition of one, unfortunately, and uh, they're challenging on rather tough challenges this week, uh, Peter. So Derek gets the subject, and there are 46 seconds. Success starting now. Success is something which has always eluded me, particularly now. Um, Kenneth Williams' challenge. The deviation is not eluded him at all. He's a very successful actor, indeed. Very successful in many... <laughs> <laughs> Successful actor, mm. successful talker, mm. successful mm. entrepreneur. Can't and... lose on that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> ah, but Derek just has lost on it. Because uh, Derek Kenneth got in with a correct challenge, and there are 37... Sorry, there are 43 seconds left of success starting now. My success came when my manager said to me, there'll be no strings attached, and drew up a marvellous contract. At propos, my professional career, because I'd said to him... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Not true. It's what the manager... It's already been established. The manager said, I'll offer you a glass of mead if I can handle you. <laughs> another place. Yes, that was another place. Um, it wasn't. Um, was after they'd drawn up the contract, he actually said, I will now offer you a glass of mead. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I'm so sorry. I thought I'd listened rather well, but I... You did <laughs> listen extremely well. You were correct in what you said, but I know not most a correct I know most you know about the lady with the Frankfurters and, and Great Portland Street and all those things. I thought I did know the history of the signing of the contract after 11 years by now. But perhaps I did get it rather wrong. And I'm so sorry. I would like to withdraw that challenge. And Thank I do you very much, pardon. Pierre. Very sweet of you, my dear. You <laughs> have uh, an incorrect challenge, so Kenneth gets another point, and there are 27 seconds. Success, Kenneth, starting now. It came with this early engagement <gasps> where I was... Uh, Derek Nemo challenge. Repetition of came. He came twice. <laughs> success came to me. A success came, came yeah. to you right at the beginning. I'm sorry, that is true, Kenneth. So on this occasion, Derek has a correct challenge. There are 24 seconds for success, Derek, starting now. I do admire successful people. Look at Nicholas Parsons. When one gazes at that wonderfully benign, intelligent, broad-minded man, you think, gosh, if I had the same success as he, where would I be in life? And I'm sure you ask yourself much the same question. I'm no one would be able to confront... Uh, Kevin Freud has challenged. Hesitation. No, I was enjoying it. <laughs> Actually, quite frankly, I was mystified. Derek Nimmo is now paying me compliments. Derek, are you feeling all right? <laughs> I, when you start paying me compliments, that's when I worry you about You should let me go on a bit, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I am always fair in this game and have decided that you were not hesitating, you have three and a half minutes to continue with success, Me? starting <laughs> now. The success of Mr. Clement Freud is one of the great mysteries of life, I find, because... <laughs> well, Kenneth, I'm um, sorry, uh, Derek Nimmo uh, said quite a lot in that round, had some incorrect challenges against him, gained some points, including one for speaking as a whistle went. He's now in a strong lead. Uh, Kenneth, will you begin the next round? The subject that Ian Messard has thought up for you is Samuel Crompton. Knowing your proclivity, to use your words, for history, will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? A brilliant man who, through the invention of a spinning machine which could make a fine fibre, he was done out of what was rightfully his by his ignorance of the patenting methods which other people grabbed and therefore he ended up poverty-stricken and only the good, gracious handling of a few nice people who secured for him a sum I am reliably informed <laughs> was 5,000 nicker. Then he went back to Bolton broken-hearted, which is a great shame because he was in the early stages a fiddler. He played the violin, you know, in the orchestra pit at the aforementioned town in the Midlands, and was... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Deviation. Bolton is not in the Midlands. No, I'm afraid it's in the north of England. Oh, I thought show. it was the Midlands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the oh, people... Well, if it wants to get to the Midlands, it'll have to get a bolt on, won't it? <laughs> 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 so, Kenneth, uh, very bad luck, because you kept going for... Kenneth, you kept going for 57 minutes on the subject that was chosen for you. And Clement Freud has now They're got... They're all shouting at you for saying minutes. You're supposed to say seconds. I know. I, I just want to see if they're awake. Oh, I... <laughs> they aren't. <laughs> 57 seconds, uh, you're quite right. And there are three seconds left for Clement Freud to tell us something about Samuel Com Crompton starting now. There was quite recently a Samuel Crompton exhibition. <laughs> So, uh, Clement Freud, with uh, the challenge and speaking as the whistle went, has now uh, crept up and is equal in second place with Peter Jones and Kenneth Williams. Derek Nemo is still our leader. Clement, will you begin the next round? The subject, champions, and will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? A champion, I suppose, is anyone who does what he performs better than anyone else at the same thing, if you follow my meaning. And there is published annually the Guinness Book of Records, which lists champions of such amazingly unusual occupations as propelling a champagne cork a maximum distance from its bottle, which you do, quite simply, by heating the container of glass. And obviously, the hotter it is, the further will the bouchon fly. <laughs> I myself figure in this volume because on an unhappy occasion in Nottingham, 
I was persuaded to make omelettes, of which I produced 123 when the eggs ran out. And if you look at the relevant page in the literary uh, work Derek Nemo edited well, by... Yes, because he couldn't running. think of another mm. way to say the Guinness Book of Records. So, Derek, you got in there, and there are six seconds it's left a for... a short hesitation, wasn't it? It wasn't... It was a short hesitation. Them. But people were walking out over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, champions, it's with you now, Derek. Six seconds, starting now. James Hunt, old Wellingtonian, living at Belmont and Sally. How proud we all are of him. The wonderful achievement that he's had this last year. I'm sure six seconds <laughs> So Derek Nimmo uh, got that extra point. He's increased his lead, and he's going to begin the next round. This is the last show in the present series, as I said, said at the beginning of the show, and so we've got a very apt subject, when we meet again, which we all ardently hope. So will you talk on the subject, Derek, in just a minute, starting now? When we meet again. Gosh, it can't be for at least six months, I suppose, with any luck. I hope perhaps we might never meet some of the people in this team ever again, but I suppose it could happen. But then, when we do confront one another, we'll have all the same boring things to say. We've been chatting to one another for the last 11 years. And uh, Kenneth Williams challenge. Deviation. He has maintained that we have boring things to say. Me? Boring? I mean, <laughs> this is an allegation I've ever heard. Everybody knows I am the spirit, the party spirit. People say to me, you're the life and soul. I mean, they're all think I'm the most diverting, original, brilliant, energetic creature that ever walked across a stage. And here he is, just there saying, we're going to say no boring rubbish. I mean... Well, I must say, that is the first time... That's the first time I've heard anybody promote himself and get a round of applause for it. <laughs> So by that, do I assume that you mean that uh, uh, Kenneth Williams... I'm sorry, it's my cold. Kenneth Williams' challenge is correct and he should have the subject. Yeah. Yeah. Kenneth, will you tell us something about when we meet again in... Uh, and there are uh, 37 seconds left starting now. When we meet again, the spirit of... To say joie de vivre, and then I thought of bonnet over the windmill, and it came out as bois. <laughs> and then I thought I can't make it bois de velon. <laughs> <laughs> So, Clement Freud challenge. You understand my predicament? Yes. Oh. yes. We I often... was ejaculating like mad there. Ke uh, Clement, what is your challenge? Hesitation. Uh, yes, there are a lot of other things as well. But... <laughs> so, this may be the last round, so it looks as if we're going to hear from all four of our. <laughs> Worthy panellists, and there are 33 seconds left for When We Meet Again, Clement, starting now. When we meet again, there's every likelihood that each of us will be wearing the same awful, boring clothes which we now have on, because if ever there was sartorially a shoddy show, this one has got to be it, with the occasional <laughs> departure from totally uh, inelegant... Uh, challenge. Well, I can't allow him to drone on like this because he's committing professional suicide by <laughs> advertising. I mean, a lot of people don't realise it's boring. They <laughs> uh, enjoying it. And a lot of people know that there are some very well-dressed people on this programme, including yourself and Derek Nemo and... Oh. Uh, we're not going to mention anybody else. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to hear from you, which is very nice, Peter. So we've heard from everybody in the last round. There are 14 seconds when we meet again, starting now. Well, I only hope that we shall be given more interesting subjects. I'd like to talk about Marcel Proust and his later years, for instance, and not have this subject given to Kenneth Williams. Um, I would Clement Freud has challenged. Repetition of subject. But we haven't heard from Ian Messiter, perhaps. Well, Ian Messiter, there are two seconds left. Will you take over the subject now of when we meet again, as starting now? I'm very glad you've asked me to talk about when we'll meet again, because time's up. <laughs> Messiter gets a point for speaking when the whistle went. And at the end of that round, which is also the end of the contest, I will now give you the final score. Ian Messiter gained one point. 
he finishes in fifth place. <laughs> he's never spoken before in the game, and he's not likely to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Three seconds he kept going, so we must applaud him for his uh, uh, arduous attempts. Um, I would obviously like to hear more from you, Ian. Peter Jones and Kenneth Williams finished in third place in this particular programme, two points behind Clement Freud, who made a last finale flourish but failed to catch up the leader who uh, kept his lead to the end and finishes up as our winner, Derek Nimmo. If I haven't mentioned it enough already, this is the end of this particular series of Just a Minute, so I'm sure each one of our four regular panelists would like to briefly say goodbye. So, first of all, Kenneth, would you like to say... Bye-bye, and thank you ever so much. It's been really wonderful for you to have me. <laughs> Clement, uh, Clement Freud? With which sentiment I would like to... <laughs> I would like to associate myself. You would. <laughs> Peter Jones? I'll say by ditto in case somebody buzzes and... <laughs> and uh, Derek Nimmo. Goodbye. <laughs> the chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by John Browell. <laughs>